man who's never had the wool pulled over his eyes, but does have steel wool on his head, Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice for getting on a mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Bull Brian is out for a little bit more, but uh, do not worry. He shall uh, be here. Playing Mark- the role of Brian is some tumbleweed. That's right. And uh, let's see. Martin Degard writes all those mm-hmm. books with O'Reilly, just becomes an expert on everything, and uh, get in and talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is World War II. Yeah. I just am obsessed with World War II. And we'll talk about taking Berlin, and uh, we got all that. But I got a bunch of other stuff to uh, get into, too. Something I've been uh, studying and looking at a little bit is uh, they made a lot of rules about um, what you can do in the end zone in terms of celebrations. The NFL, who uh, they say stand for the No Fun League. (laughs) They, or not for long, depending on what clip you're looking at of a coach yelling at a referee. Uh Um, They have uh, made a lot of rules. Um, No dropping down to your knees, although you could drop down to a knee if you're praying. Oh, um, Tim Tebow versus the guy that had the cell phone in the post and called his mom. Right. No no taking your helmet off right. in the end zone. No doing the throat slit oh. thing. There used to be uh, the throat slit sure, thing. Sure. See a lot of cage fighters do that right. move. Uh, no throat slitting. Uh, n- no bunch of stuff. No but, choreography. But Well, they'll let you do. They'll let you get down. Oh. Yeah, they'll let you do choreography. Oh, that's great. They'll let everyone get together and paddle the outrigger canoe from the beginning of Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> uh, they'll let you do a golf putt where okay. all the other players fall over once that's it goes in. fucking awesome. They'll let you do like... Uh, a swoop shot, like a basketball kind of a running jumper. They'll, they'll let you do that okay. stuff. And and there's something they'll let you do that formally wasn't an end zone celebration, but there's they're going to outlaw it. Uh-oh. They have to. What? And I've been seeing this from all different teams and all different players. There was a day when there was no celebration. The, um, you know... Barry Sanders famously just would hand the ball to the ref. Oh, how modest. The ref would be doing the touchdown thing with his hands over his head, and then he would just put it right in his bread basket, wow. and he'd have to he'd have to grab it. Um, there are a lot of guys. I, you know, Jim Brown, I think guys like that, they just they'd flip the ball to the ref. That's quietly sexy. It was uh, act like you've been there before. Yeah, exactly. That's what they would say. And then they started spiking the ball. Yeah, Gronkowski, sure. famously, but a lot of guys would just do the ball spike. Right. Um, then recently, in the last couple of years, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. So first, there was no celebrations when you sack the quarterback. Then it became a sack the quarterback joyous dance. Mm. And now... All celebrations have sort of morphed into this primal scream where you just went like, yeah! you just, it was like Viking on top of the mountain, both arms out, flexed, and you just screamed. Screamed to the heavens. And it was sort of like, it was kind of interesting. It was like, we went from celebrating to a crazy banshee Mm. war cry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was almost non-celebratory, but more like we're on the war path and and we're going. And and now everyone just puts their arms down to their side, flexes and stomps and screams (laughs) as loud as they can. And people say football's too aggressive, full of toxic masculinity. (laughs) And it's like, eh, you sacked the quarterback. It was a coverage sack. It was in the second quarter. You're down by 17 points. Do we need that much? Yeah. So you're you're getting paid 17 million bucks a year (laughs) to sack the quarterback. This is your third in nine games. How much screaming do you need to do? But... In the end zone, many players are doing this now. They do the scream, and they chuck the ball as hard as they can at the wall that's at the back of the end zone. There's a padded wall. And they just throw it as hard as they can at that wall. And these guys are grown-ass men who are running full speed. Like, a lot of times, they're they're on the run at the back of that wall, and it's a running start with a chuck. Plus... 
most of the guys who, who get to the show, a lot of the skilled guys, the wide outs, guys that get into the end zone, they played some quarterback in high school. Sure. Because in high school, they just went, we'll take the best athlete on the team. He'll be the yeah. quarterback. Let him just get it out of the shotgun and run. And, you know, later on, they convert them. Like they're like, eh, this guy's really fast and he's got a decent arm, but he'd be better off accepting the ball from the slower white guy who threw him the ball than having him run around back there. And then you get to the NFL and everyone's fast. So a lot of these guys, I, there was some stat, but it's like, I don't know, if it's San Francisco, maybe it was Arizona, but like five guys on the offensive side of the ball played quarterback in high school yeah. and in college and they convert them over right so they got a good arm the skilled guys do and they got a full head of steam and they're celebrating they get this adrenaline dump and they just chuck the ball at the wall as hard as they can and i would always sit home and go the wall is lined with photographers and sound guys sure. and engineering guys and officials and security, sometimes cheerleaders like waiting to come out at Sometimes half-time. a kid from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Yeah, the Make-A-Wish kid is in his wheelchair. They <laughs> operate with a crazy straw. And these guys just chuck the ball waist high as hard as they fucking can at like the that. wall. And if anyone's ever taken a football to the, to the noggin, it, it'll, it'll fucking leave a mark. If one of these guys, and by the time they get to the back of the end zone and they chuck the ball as hard as they can, they're 18 feet away from right. whoever's standing against the ball. Like, if, if this was a kid's game, it would have been outlawed in the 70s. Sure. It is throw this cold, hard thing with a point at the end of it as hard as you possibly can in the direction of a group of people. Who aren't playing. Who aren't pay, playing and maybe on the phone or talking to their sideline producer or something like that. And finally, one caught a guy, camera guy in the nuts. Oh, no. So we have that from the Arizona-San Francisco game. He's got his second. Touchdown 49ers. Just hit the guy right. Hit the guy right in the nuts. <laughs> but... He seems regretful. Can it go? He does, because he sees he threw it right in the guy's no. nutsack. But can it go any other way? There's a wall of people against the stadium wall. You'd be hard-pressed <laughs> not to hit somebody if you... It would take more skill, like, if you stop it there. There's a line of human beings yeah. with 18 inches of daylight in between them, two feet, With, like, 14 fragile inches, camera equipment. Holding their hands up... up, up I, if that thing whacked the lens, it would mash yeah. the viewfinder back into your face. You'd yeah. lose a tooth. They got to make a rule. I think there's, there's right. going to be a rule. You you cannot chuck the ball full force into the and they do it all the time and they all do it and no one says anything about it. And I guess it's missed people for the most part. Well, but now they finally have an example. This guy took one in the sack, Jack. Not, not being a man. And, but just going off what I've heard, I'd rather take a football to the head than to the nuts. Yes. Certainly, uh, certainly, yeah, I would say. Although, you throw that ball and hit a dude in the face, you will break his nose. You will, well, everyone has seen the oh. episode of the Brady, Brady Bunch. Bunch. Oh, right? my nose! Marsha took one in the in the schnoz. Something suddenly came up. Ruined the prom. <laughs> That's right. Um you will break a guy's nose. Sure. You might break an orbital socket. Um, there was a guy, was it Orlando Brown, the, the giant man in the NFL? Zeus. Orlando Zeus Brown. Right? Orlando Zeus Brown was blinded by an NFL ref throwing a flag that had like some bird shot for weight in it. He just threw it and it like whacked him in the eye and it oh blinded him. Oh, my God. Him. Yes, there's precedent here. And this is this is full. This isn't an accident like that. This is this is what we do. This is the trend now. The you trend, know it's going to happen, Chris. The trend is chuck the ball at the fucking wall, right? Yeah, yeah. He was trying to throw at the wall. No, but in general, there's a lot of it. It's, that it's, the stands anywhere. Just, just, just my God. Throw it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they throw it with great velocity, great vigor. Right. So um, now that so. 
when I make my predictions, the shall be a rule, it will be a rule. It's there the will outlaw this. And I must say, I'm not uh, not a big government guy, yeah. but this, uh, chucking a ball as hard as you can into a group of uh, <laughs> unwilling people <laughs> at, at the at the end of an end zone some fucking girl's going to get her glasses broken and her face smashed yeah. i mean it's it's just going to happen yeah. and for what right. I, I don't i think this might have been around i don't know second grade or something for me can we just go back to the icky shuffle yeah that'd be nice which wasn't a very good dance no but icky did the icky shuffle that's right and they got shut down in the super bowl mm. all right uh moving on to uh, other news I don't know how this came up, but I was doing Ace on the House, and Stromer and I were doing some singing. Um, Goody. You know the name Don Cornelius? Yeah, Soul Train. Soul Train, right. I don't know if people know. Do you know Don Cornelius, Chris? I had not. Well, I think people might get him mixed up with Don Corleone. Don Cornelius hosted Soul Train for what must have been 25 years. And I know, I that was one of the biggest shows on mm-hmm. TV, probably syndicated, show up Saturday afternoon. And he didn't do much, but he stood in front of the psych at a and Records that I used to paint. And uh, I remember like having a job like Friday night, like, we got to paint this shit because they're doing Soul Train is out here filming. And everyone's been on Soul Train. Rosie Perez was famously a dancer. They had their Soul Train dancers mm-hmm. and then they would have, you know, Janet Jackson or Sugar Ray Leonard or DeBarge or... Oh. Or... or uh, uh, Spandau Ballet. It, it didn't matter if you were if you had a hit, you would go on to Soul Train and then you would airplay your hit. Sure, nothing was plugged in. <laughs> Got it. You just they you know needle drop and then you just play you just play your song. But that's like, and Don Cornelius was a funny. He, he wasn't a. He wasn't Wink Martindale. <laughs> He explained, please. He was a slow talking guy who would like show up sort of ill prepared mm. and he'd like show up and he'd be like, uh, spend out ballet. Are you guys all related? And they'd go, no, no, we're not. Well, you sure sound funny. <laughs> like that was his interview. Like I, he didn't even read the fucking one sheet before he went out there. Like, so, yeah, they all have an English accent, Don Cornelius, because they're all from England, yeah, they but they're not all related. Oh, here's his. Uh, here's his Leonard Skinner. All kinds of sound the same, but they're not all related. Right. So Don, he uh, he was in the Marines for a while, and then after that, mm-hmm. he sold tires, cars, and insurance, and then became an officer with the Chicago PD. What? Then he quit his j- day job to take a three month broadcasting course. And, uh, and re- soon after that, landed a job as an announcer and a DJ for uh, Chicago radio station. Damn. Do you have him interviewing Janet Jackson? Yeah. Just because uh, it'll just give you a little little taste of uh, Don Cornelius, who's uh, died in 2012, by the mm. way. You, uh, we, do we, Jackson we, Five, are they they're brothers? Or are you uh, guys related? Yeah, no, they're all, we're all related. Oh, okay. Yeah, but not every band that works together is related, oh. just us. Oh, what about Spandau Ballet? Are they? Uh, I don't know them personally, but I don't think so. Oh, they got that song, Gold. Uh-huh, yeah, that's a terrific song, Out of Sight. So you're doing uh, music that's uh, different than uh, before. Yeah, uh, my producers, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, want to take me in a different direction, and we're having a lot of fun. Who's Jenny Jam? Uh, Jimmy Jam, famous out of uh, Minneapolis. And you said Terry Bradshaw? Terry Lewis. He's a, he's mm. a huge what producer. What team he play for? Oh, no. He's a music producer. <laughs> so you you guys are related then? The Jackson Five, yeah. They're all they're all brothers. And then the Spandau Ballet, they're... Not to my knowledge, no, not sir. Not related? No. They sing that song, Gold, you know? Yes, I've heard that. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Mm-hmm. And uh, True. You yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what else is going on? Oh, you know, just having fun promoting the album and uh-huh. and singing and dancing. And okay. Well, I only got one mic. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, get into it. Okay. Then. We're just having Hold a lot. On, I need it back. Oh, sorry. What? I used to sell tires. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Out of sight. Then I was a cop. Oh, my goodness. And I took three months off, went to broadcasting school. 
Well, that's that's just great. So who's this uh, DJ Jelly Jeff? Oh, uh, Jimmy Jam. You said Jelly. Uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Oh, Jam's not... Jam. Yeah, not Jelly. <laughs> and uh-huh. uh, they produced me. And uh-huh. known them for a long time. Got the Minneapolis sound. You, maybe if you've heard of Prince. What's Michael like? So you got a giraffe? Oh, my brother. Oh, you uh, guys are related? Yeah, that's my brother. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you and Spano Ballet. No, we're not related. Uh, mm. Michael Jackson and I are, are siblings, yes. I know spandex kind of pants, but I don't, I don't get the ballet part. Uh, I think that's spandex. Mm. I, think some of our, I think some of our soul-trained dancers are wearing spandex pants right now. Oh, maybe. I always heard it pronounced spandex. Anyway, mm. um, our new album is, is really, really, really great, and mm. I'm really happy that I got to get to be here today and play it for you. So Barry Lewis and Jimmy Jam, they... Uh, Terry Lewis, mm-hmm. They... They, uh, they produce me. Did you play the uh, instruments there? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. No, I sing and I dance. I perform, mm. uh-huh, just mm. like you the got one for us. You got one You want to perform for us now? Oh, I, I'd love to. That'd be out of sight. Is it called out of sight? No, no, sir. Well, you said it was out of sight. No, it's called um, Promise of a New Day. Oh, okay. And um, we'd love to perform it for you live now. Okay, even though none of the instruments are plugged in? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that was something that oh, we announced mic. on the show. <laughs> yeah, wait for your turn with the mic. Oh, sorry. I'm talking now, and we can only afford one mic. Okay, sir. We're the biggest syndicated show on television, but we still just have the one mic. Huh. The reason... We're so successful because we don't waste our money on mics. You that understand? Ma- that makes sense, sir. Yeah. Sir. I would wait for the. What did you say? Oh, thank you. Um, the song. Hold on, I need the mic okay, back. Okay, sure, no problem. I used to sell insurance, used cars, and tires. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. During the winter, I'd sell snow tires. Oh, sure, yeah, that makes sense. But, but I worked out of Linwood, California, so. You know, that's interesting. We didn't because move as many. Wait for your turn oh, with the sorry. mic. Oh, okay. We, didn't, we, didn't, we only got the one mic. We didn't, we didn't move as many snow tires well, in I, Linwood. Oh, sorry. During the winter months, even. Uh-huh, sure. Well, you might know my family. Uh, we all grew up in Indiana, and it was very, very snowy winters. You guys out from uh, New Brunswick? No, uh we are from a uh, small town in Indiana. So you got brothers and sisters? I do. Uh, the Jackson. Are they musical too? They are. Maybe you've heard of the Jackson Five. I think we. Oh yeah, have... they were on last week. That's right. That's my brothers. I mm-hmm. love that Toto kid, man. That kid can play. Tito. He plays too, right? Uh yeah. There's just Tito, no Toto. Mm-hmm. That's a different band. Okay, so we got uh, Michael. Mm-hmm. Toto. Tito. Tito. Toto and Tito. Just so that's the one. Three. No, t- the- so just Toto. Okay. And then we got uh, Jermichael. Jermaine. Okay. Well, that's not what he said. Oh, I think it was. And then uh, we got your, we got your. Is Tiffany in your family? Or is that a different no, person? No, that's a, that's a different person. You're probably thinking of Latoya. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's not in the. She's she's a performer, but she's not part of the Jackson Five officially. I worked for Q One Hundred and One out of Chicago for oh, fourteen years. That's amazing. Yeah, wait for your mic. Okay. Here you go. Thank you. That's a real amazing story. Find him in inter- her. Find him interviewing Spandau Ballet. It's like he's on <laughs> Thorazine. <laughs> that's right. But he did have some energy. When? Well, he said Soul Train. He said Soul. Or is that him or the announcer? I don't. I don't think he had on camera energy, <laughs> but <laughs> he saves that for off air. Off air, oh. he was a calorie burner. Why did he save it for when the mics <clears throat> went cold? I don't know, but there's a story I told Chris to uh, look up. A couple of uh, former Playboy bunnies. Oh shit! Made a couple of accusations. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Recently, this is uh, really? this year. A and E released a. Uh, a mini series, Secrets of Playboy, where Cornelius was accused of sexually assaulting two Playboy bunnies in the 70s. I'm going to get my dick out now. So hold on. Yeah. The, the women were alleged <laughs> You to two have... bunnies related? You from the same farm? <laughs> no. Okay. She's Asian. <laughs> oh, you're not Asian? No, I'm from Juno. Who know? Juno, I Alaska. Do not. I don't know where you're from. No, we're, we we look not literally nothing alike. Where are you from? 
I'm from Juno. And I do not know. Oh no, Juno, Alaska. What part of Alaska? In Juno. I don't know. Okay. You gotta tell me. <laughs> Juno. I well, if you say so. Look, I'm gonna lock you in this closet. Oh! That's how it went, because the women were alleged to have been brought to Cornelius's house for a three-day period where they were locked in separate rooms, <gasps> bound, <gasps> drugged, and sexually assaulted. Holy shit! Well, they were probably drugged with the same thing he's on. <laughs> the orzine drip. He roofied himself. Yeah. Oh, my God! Yeah. See, all your idols, all the greats, they've all got to come down, don't they? God Damn. You grew up worshiping Soul Train and sure. Don Cornelius. Well, Cosby... I knew if someone asked young Gina Grab, oh. would you like to hang out with Don Cornelius at his Beverly Hills estate for a long three-day weekend? Yes, yes, and yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. That is crazy. That's not just... And that that is not a he said, she said accusation. That is locked in a room, bound, drugged, and raped. Who and two of them, what did they, whatever became of the case? Well, um, that, that still remains to be seen, but uh, his son is denying it, saying that there's no proof and this is uh, what is it? an outrage. By the way, so they're suing the estate. How would his son know? <clears throat> exactly. You know what I mean? Like, you think I would say to Sonny, like, before I died, listen, boy, you're going to hear a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't you believe any of them? <laughs> like what? <laughs> From the off the top of my head, yeah, give me a general category. Uh, one time I turned a lease in over the mileage. Oh, I, I think that's forgivable. And I ignored the oil change light that was on the leased car, you know so what? that was kind of a ding. And I've then done that uh, myself. there were these two chicks on the Playboy Mansion. I bound and raped and drugged in my uh, separate rooms. What? You remember your old room, right? Yes. I use it for other things now, like for bounding and, and doing what. Are we talking about the lease? No. Talking about the, you said you, you bound and, what did you do? You bound and raped and. No, I said I didn't do it. <laughs> People are going to talk. But why would that come into anyone's head? That's very specific. You know when George Burns died? Yeah. There are all those allegations about him abducting women and binding them and drugging them and raping them. I don't remember that now. Well, because he talked to his son. Oh. That's why we're here, boy. Got it. Could you give me that little sippy cup that's on the stand with the wheels? Goo goo gaga. <laughs> so nothing came of it? No charges were pressed or anything? Because in California, you get, I think, quite the extension when it comes to that statutory limit, right? Yeah, well, good luck. The look back law. Or prosecuting. The look back He's been in the ground for 10 years. <laughs> Didn't seem to tarnish his star much. This Still is the first I'm hearing Don of it. Don Cornelius. Yeah. Didn't... Wow. What a psychopath, it must allegedly. have been a heavy news cycle or something when that thing dropped. Because the beginning of this year. I didn't uh, hear a goddamn thing about it. Do you know how many news sources I scan a day and this rings no bells? Right. But you, I mean, everything. You know the whole Rick James story, though, right? I know he had a coke problem. Mm. You didn't hear any more about that? No. Him and uh, Don Cornelius must have hung out a little bit and traded a few stories. Really? Oh, the Rick James. Oh, Chris, you knew the Rick James story, right? Yes. Yeah. Gene, I'm surprised you didn't know the tell Rick James this, story. Tell me this. Yeah, tell me and I'll tell you if it rings any bells. Okay. In the 90s, uh, his drug abuse was public knowledge. He's heavily addicted to cocaine and later admitted to spending about 7000 a week for five years straight on it. In August of 91, James and his girlfriend Tanya were arrested on charges of holding 24-year-old Frances Alley hostage for up to six days, tying her up, forcing her to perform sexual acts, and burning her legs and abdomen with the hot end of a crack pipe during a week-long cocaine binge. What? So he was just he was just fucking out of his mind, just whacked out on drugs and mm -hmm. torturing people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Did he do time for I So um while out on and then while out on bail for that incident, uh James assaulted music exec Mary Sow Souger of the St. James Club or at the St. James Club in Hollywood. 
And um, let's see. He was found guilty of both offenses, but was cleared of a torture charge that could have put him in prison for the rest of his life. While serving his five-year sentence at Folsom Prison, James oh. lost a civil suit to Sauger, who was awarded nearly $2 million in damages. He was ordered to pay her about $1 million. Um, he was released from prison after serving j- just over two years. Wow. So I would say you'd be better off being with Don Cornelius than with Rick James, but it'd be a close call. I mean, at least you wouldn't get burned. And one was a three-day weekend, right. and the other was six days. So Jesus. I'd say you'd, you'd hope for Don Cornelius. I think it's, I mean, I think it's kind of a photo finish. It's close. Yeah. But Cornelius never did any time. He later on got busted for, like, domestic violence and stuff. Shocker. It's always weird when you see these guys that are just, like, you know, you got to find uh, Spandau Ballet now. Is that... it's, not on, it's not online, but we do see that they were on the same episode as the Four Tops. So oh, to what, a, what a wide chasm. Uh, Is it many, Spandau Ballet? How many tops, you guys? <laughs> oh, with four. Any bottoms? No, not that kind of top. Uh, these are like spinning tops. I, like I'm a... familiar with the lingo of the gay man. No, no, no. Uh, um, are you familiar with the dreidel? You four? No, I don't support that community. Oh. Are you uh, guys all related? We are not, sir. No, we, 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 we're four of us, and we we harmonize, and we've been together. You know, long... Spandau Ballet. Those are all brothers. Uh. You ever tour with Spandau Ballet? No, sir. That's not our genre, but I I don't think they're related. Mm. I saw the Three Bottoms, which is a four top cover group. We're not affiliated with them, and they are not licensed to to play our music. Understood. As brothers, a lot of fighting going on on tour. Yeah, we're not actually related. Mm. We just sing together. Not like Spandau Ballet. Yeah, they're not either. You know a lot about Spandau Ballet for being a Detroit soul-based band. We talked and we share a green room. We're on the right. same episode. Well, why don't you just do Sugar Pie Honey Bunch or something, and I'll, I'll just step back. Don't plug in your instruments. Yeah, uh, no need. So, uh, yeah, I actually I saw Chris him interviewing them on a spa, there's a Spandau Ballet documentary. Why? Did, which how did I'm, that come across your TV? I'm gonna watch the shit out of that. I was talking about him, and Gary found it on the computer, and there was a there was a Soul Train wasn't, interview in there. Wasn't there a big hit? I know this much. There's is true. true. That's there's, like the big one, right? There's gold, which you've heard. I just know true. You will. You might know gold. Okay. And there was there was another kind of slightly punkier sort of hit that they had. They've had a the Spandau Ballet was a huge band. Are you professing your love for Spandau Ballet? No, the first time I don't like Spandau up. Ballet, but they filled Wembley Stadium five <laughs> times. I mean, you forget. Look, if you've heard of these guys, they had they had a time. Right. And they were big, big band. Only when you leave or I'll fly for you. I don't know that one. Do you know what Spandau Ballet means? Uh, well, they're talking about the concentration camp, right? Oh, is that it? I I thought Spandau was one of the many. You might be right. This is from The Telegraph. It says, the Spandau Ballet was the nickname given to the swinging, twitching movement of a hanging body. Oh. Incidentally, though, it appears the phrase is even older and was coined during the Second World War. Spandau was a manufacturer of Nazi machine guns. What the fuck is wrong with these people? That's what I... I had something with Nazis in them. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Kind of morbid. Mm -hmm. All right. Chris will find that. I'll tell you about the skylight frames. Holidays just around the corner. Hard to get cool gifts for people because everyone kind of has what they want now. And that's why you got to get skylight frames. Um, This is a really interesting technology. Uh, It's a photo frame and you can update it instantly by email from anywhere. So, you know, put it up in your family room and then you take the kid on vacation and he fell down in a pile of snow and you take the picture and pow it's up on the screen it's up on grandma and grandpa's mantle up on grandma yeah it's set up as easy it's under 60 seconds you just plug it in use the touch screen to connect to your wireless network and then enjoy gary has one he loves it he gives it to his uh grandparents Mm -hmm. and then they just show never-ending 
cacophony of kid photos on there. Two size options, original 10-inch or new larger 15-inch format. Uh, so it's a 10-inch frame or a 15-inch frame. 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't love your sky skylight, they'll offer you a full refund, but you will. Am I right, Dawson? Now, as a special offer, you can get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter code ADAM. That's right. To get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter code ADAM. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, promo code ADAM. All right. Uh, Do we have Spandau on Soul Train? Yeah, so uh, you watched the trailer for their documentary. Yes. So, and uh, yeah, at the end of it, they cut to a clip of them on Soul Train. So here we go. <laughs> now, listen to the uh, unstoppable force of nature that is Don <laughs> Cornelius. I'm thinking he saved all this energy for the drugging. Yeah. Mm hmm. Still just a one mic. Now there's six dudes on stage. I got one fucking mic. Yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if Don Cornelius would. I wonder if that carried over into his oh. civilian life. Like he'd go out and you go like, you want a snow cone? Oh, I'd love one. Thank you. Just I'll a, take just, a... Uh, well, just a one. Yeah, I only want one. No, no. I'll take I, a... Between... Cherry. No, I need... We're just a one between us. Oh, do you not have an extra 85 cents? I just do the one where I take a lick, and then I hand it back to you, then you take a lick. Um, You know what? I I could probably get my you own. You want to go to the movies tonight? I would love to. You want to sit on my lap or should I sit on your lap? Oh, I think just there's a probably... One, just a one chair. It, we're going to a movie theater with just, one chair? No, they have a lot of chairs. Oh, I great. Do, I do one. <laughs> um, you want a churro? Uh, churros are my favorite you dessert. See, you see that movie, The Lady in the Tram? I love Lady in the Tram. That's how we're going to eat this churro. Oh, starting from each end? Yes, yeah, right. I do one. I got one microphone. They're literally 20 cents. <laughs> you have more Spandau? Yeah, so the whole movie's on YouTube, so let's, uh, let's watch the whole clip. All right. Well, there's oh, there the go. dynamic Don Cornelius, everybody. Wow. He And he went from being a, all those things, a typewriter setter or whatever, to a cop, to the most famous man in America for a while. As a cop, he should have known better mm. with the Playboy bunnies. Yeah. True. All right. Author Martin DeGard is in here. You know the name, writes all the O'Reilly books. And he writes his own books. And we'll talk about uh, taking Berlin with Martin DeGard right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, John in Baltimore. A couple weeks ago, you talked about Gina's gynecologist. I think it was Dr. Kruger. My wife has had the same one until he recently retired for over 30 years. His name, Dr. Fingerhood. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. We got book writer Martin DeGuard here. Uh, You related to Bill O'Reilly? No. No? So not like Spandau Ballet. Do you know the Jackson Five actually a family? <laughs> the great Don Cornelius. Martin DeGard is here taking Berlin, the bloody race to defeat the Third Reich. And I'm, uh, I'm just enamored. Uh, enamored is not the right word, but fascinated with all things World War II. So oh, great. you've come to the right place. Uh, so we had the Soviets and we had the Americans kind of closing in. At the same time, or the Soviets were on the Eastern Front doing battle? Soviets had the Eastern Front, and their version of D-Day was called Operation Bagration. And then uh, Americans and the Canadians and the British were on the West, kind of squeezing on both sides. And did they think Hitler was still alive, or was it known that he had committed suicide before they got there? It wasn't, no, nobody knew, but, you know, he came out of the bunker, you know, he... He shot himself, and then um, they, then they brought his body up, and they used like six gallons of gasoline to burn his body because it turns out the body has more water in it than most people know, and they could only identify it from his um, dental records. So he killed himself with a gunshot? Gunshot. He took uh, a cyanide pill and then, oh, cra- then cracked it and then shot himself. Oh, double. Because yeah. it's funny because I, I thought cyanide was a kind of weapon of choice for yeah. the Nazis. You just don't want to mess around. 
and he, did he do that? I know that's not what the book is all about, but was there a group of generals around him? Like, was it known, like, hey, Monday, noon, <laughs> it's you know, day. here we well, go. You know, so he was way down in the bunker. He was in a room with Eva Braun. She killed herself. Then he killed himself. And the reason he killed himself was he didn't want the Soviets to get a hold of him. He was afraid of what they were going to do to him. And they burned the body so the Soviets couldn't kind of parade it through the streets and tear it up. Mm. But Joseph Goebbels was in, you know, his propaganda minister was in the bunker as well, poisoned his kids. Then he then he shot his wife, then he shot himself. So wow. not, not a happy place. Jesus, Goebbels poisoned his kids. Because you wouldn't do that now because it's like... Um, Saddam Hussein has cousins shopping in New York mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Like we don't, we don't blame the family. But back then, they probably would have taken yeah. their pound of flesh yeah. out on the kids, especially right? the Soviets. The Soviets were horrible. Yeah. yeah, we're seeing it now in the Ukraine. It's the same thing. Same. Um, who you know. who would treat their prisoners worse, the Japanese or Soviets? Ooh, good question. Um, the Japanese would probably behead you. So you'd, you'd be done quickly. Mm-hmm. The Soviets took a lot of prisoners and put them in concentration camps back in Siberia. So, you know, you'd be, you wouldn't be dead, but at the same time, you would be there forever. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and if you did come out of it, like uh, if you go to some of the war museums in, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, you'll see that the people who came back were just never the same. And the Japanese may work you to death too, right? Right. Well, yep. the only thing I actually know about that is from the movie about Louis Zamperini. Oh, yeah. And it, when you asked that question, who's worse, I was like thinking, that was pretty brutal. Yeah. So, I mean, was it a photo finish or you would still say probably better to be in that? I don't know. You know, the thing about it is the, the Soviets had – yeah, the Japanese were horrible. So, the, But the Soviets had a particular thing for the Germans because mm-hmm. the Germans um, – when the Germans invaded Moscow – really getting into the weeds here, but uh, they just raped and pillaged and burned and did everything to defile the Soviet people. They just, you know, leveled everything. When the Soviets, you know, reversed everything and began pushing towards Berlin, they repaid that favor in kind even more horrifically. So it was more punitive. More punitive. I mean, when they when they came into Berlin, they would rape women and cut off their breasts afterward. I mean, it's just Jesus. that kind of stuff. Did... Um so how long before the invasion of Berlin did Hitler take himself out? Just a few days. Let's see. Let's see. VE Day is, I think he, April 28th or 29th was the day the Soviets entered, and he, he killed himself like the day before. So he definitely heard the cannons in the distance. And yeah, it was coming. Did the Read the writing on the wall. So he yeah, stuck it out as long as he could. And everybody else, like, you know, Goering was trying to get out of the country. Everyone was trying to flee, and he was stuck in Berlin. He couldn't get out of Berlin, and he knew they were coming. So at some point, he just did what he had to do. It was... Um, uh, was know. it a tactical mistake for him to hunker down in the in Berlin, in 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 the center of Germany, or in, in the, uh, you know, what would be the... Oh, what do we call it? The... Uh, Sacramento is the, the capital. The capital, oh, yeah. essentially. Like, it, I don't know. If, is Berlin the capital? Of Berlin's make, the capital. Why, why, why bury yourself in the capital? Like, why not go to the, the eagle's, eagle's nest, nest or it, go somewhere yeah, in the outskirts of town? It doesn't make any sense because Berlin is right on the way, the Soviet corridor through Poland. Berlin is right there. It's in northern Germany. It's a, it's a place to go. And, you know, it's interesting. If you go to Berlin now... You know, right by the Bundestag, which is the seat of government, um, the place where the bunker used to be, the Soviets leveled it and filled it in. But now it's just uh, it's like right next to a bunch of apartment buildings, and there's just a sign saying this was where the bunker is. And it's it's really anticlimactic. But when you think about it, that was the seat of German power, you know, for a long time. Did the troops? How hard did the Germans fight on once Hitler was gone? Oh, they were done. That that was it. I mean, they were in their biggest thing was getting out, going. They wanted to get west as far as possible. I mean, you know, General Game, James Gavin, the head of the 82nd Airborne, he accepted the surrender of like 100,000 Germans in one day because they didn't want to be taken by the Soviets. They would rather go to the Americans, at least have a standing chance, because the Americans weren't going to kill them or torture them. They were just going to put them in a prison camp. 
Yeah. I mean, I know everyone talks a lot of shit about our country, but there's a kind of a bottom line, which is who <laughs> would you rather surrender to? When you're, be- when you're yep. begging to go with the Americans. <laughs> I would that's say true, that's yeah. a more decent culture. Than, uh, and the, uh, yeah, people forget about all, I mean, we only learn about sort of American-based uh, atrocities, but there are many, many atrocities in the times of war. And the, the Soviets are just a weird... <laughs> They're just a hard people, and I don't know. Yeah. Is it is it the conditions that make them hard? Like, why they're know. so much different than so many other Europeans? They're just so they're, much harder. You know, I'm reading a book right now um, about the Vikings. It's just a random book I picked up. Picked up, and you know, the Vikings were everywhere, but one of the groups that they traveled and, and they met with was the the four fathers, the forebears of the Soviet people, and it was just a tribe called the Rus, R-U-S, which is where we get Russians, and they were bad even then, 14 <laughs> centuries ago. You know, it's, it's just like it's in their blood. It's just horrible. Yeah, it's like, in a weird way, it's like they're nurse sharks, and then there's tiger sharks, and there's bull sharks, and yeah. there's blue sharks, and they're all just sharks. Some are super aggressive and mean, and some are yeah. kind of docile. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I, I guess cultures and yeah. humans are, are that way. I don't know how that works, though. You know, when you think about it, it's, you know, centuries of genetic alteration. Who knows how that works? So they're, uh, the Soviets are leading the charge into Berlin? Well, you know what? We were we were all like, you know, Pat and Montgomery were, were coming in from the west, and they were racing there. And then um, the Soviets were coming in from the east. And for a while, it looked like it would kind of be a dead heat. You know, Patton was really making a lot of ground after after the Battle of the Bulge. And, you know, this is what I try to put forth in the book. In the book, I think when people read, they know that it's going to be a history book. They think it's going to be slow and boring and it's going to be full of just, you know, dumb details. But with this book, I tried to – with that period of history was was fast-paced. It was, it was like – it should read like a thriller. So the way I wrote this book was that people should feel like they're in the action. They should feel like they're right there. They should keep turning the pages. It's not going to put you to sleep. Um, in the, one of, you know, in, to dramatize that race to Berlin, that's one of the, the reasons I wanted to make sure that this was had that really fast pace because there was a – we didn't really trust the Soviets, but and at the same time we wanted to get to Berlin first, not because it was necessarily a strategic thing to do. It was just more about the glory of getting to Berlin first. And basically it's a one-upmanship at the end of the war – so that we can tell the so we so we can basically put the Soviets in their place and say you know we're here first and we're going to dictate what life is going to be like here for these Germans, just like we had done with every place else that we had liberated, you know the Soviets would come in and just they'd liberate some place and then do their thing where they killed people and raped people, you know, we were going to go in and be the voice of reason and then Eisenhower stopped you know in the middle of March basically said we're you know we're not going to risk American lives to go into Berlin the the Russians can have it. Did they uh, – who did they liberate first, Paris or France or Berlin? Paris. Paris was August 26, 1944. I can't remember my own kids' birthdays, but I remember <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, August 26, 1944. Berlin was all the way in May. So between then you have you – know, Oh, so it was quite some time. It was, yeah, there was like – you had like Market Garden, Hurricane Forest, Battle of the Bulge. And we were actually going to do a parachute drop with the 82nd Airborne like – a whole hundred thousand men dropping on Berlin and then getting the 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 German surrender that way to make sure we got there first. And it was just at some point they decided it was, it was just too much. I don't know why this has popped in my head, but I think it was a in the Battle of the Bulge. But you tell me, what's the famous story of the American general who was like surrounded by Germans and somebody ran a note into him yeah. saying, "Hey, why don't you just give up?" Yeah. It's going to be a lot easier. Was that Battle of the Bulge? It was Battle of the Bulge. It was the city of Bastogne. Um, General McAuliffe. His yeah. answer, Gina, was the, the best. Yeah, I don't know this. That's a great story. Yeah, they're completely surrounded by the Germans. They're out of food. They're out of ammunition. It's, it's cold, right? It's cold. It's, the, it's, it's Christmas, you know, and, and they're freezing. And so the, the Germans sent in this surrender thing, basically requesting the American surrender. And he, sent, he pretended that he was going to accept the German surrender instead. And then when the Germans pressed, pressed the issue, his response was nuts. And the German didn't understand what He nuts. just wrote nuts back yeah. on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> like nuts to you. Yeah. So yeah. it was um, 
Yeah, pretty ballsy if when you think about it. <laughs> Did they, I don't know what happened after he wrote nuts. Did they get wiped out or frozen out? No, Patton saved him. Patton, oh, that's Patton, right. Remember Patton turned Third Army and they they went to Bastogne and um, it's kind of neat if you go into the center of Bastogne now, you can see where the where that took place. It's like there's a cafe right there in the town center. It's it's pretty neat. I have a question, being someone who's very interested in World War II, but not nearly as knowledgeable as, as either of you in this room. Um, it, from what, we, what we're what we told, it feels like people say the Americans sure took their sweet time getting over there. Why is that? And what, Can you speak to that a little bit? We knew, oh, sure. we, we knew what was going on with Auschwitz and Birkenbelden. We knew all of that, right? No, not at the beginning. Not at the beginning, no. but, but the, we, the, we had known the it. The New York Times was tamping down that story see this is th- they don't teach this in Hebrew school yeah no uh, but I am wondering <laughs> well, like Chris what? can find that but the New York Times lest you think whatever they're doing yeah. with COVID or the Hunter yeah. Biden laptop is new <laughs> they've been doing this shit for a long time very interesting yeah. the guy who tamped down the whole ethnic cleansing Jew killing everything that guy won a Pulitzer Jesus Christ yeah, it's a, uh, or maybe Martin knows more yeah, about Yeah, I'd love that, to know what, yes. what was the lag, and was there a lag, and why? Well, people didn't believe it. You know, the Germans didn't start their... They, they began killing Jews as soon as they invaded Poland, for instance, but they didn't um, solidify their, their basic, their whole plan for genocide until January 1942. Um, and that was just when we were entering the war, and when all these reports trickled out about you know, the, the concentration camps and things that were happening. Nobody believed it. Mm. And the New York Times, like, somebody came out, was it had proof, and New York Times buried it on, like, page 17. It was just one of those things. I mean, that... But that why? I, why? That's a headline story, is it not? That's a really, really good question. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, we were, as we were entering the war, we had we had been a, a very pacifist nation the whole time. I mean, when Roosevelt ran his for his last term, it was before... Uh, Pearl Harbor and his whole thing is like we're not going to war, mm. and the whole and I don't think that they wanted to give anybody a reason to have any, beef with us. Yeah, and so and then you know when you think about it too, we came in in December 1941. We're we're ostensibly at war with all these people. We didn't begin fighting for really fighting for almost a year um, in North Africa, and then you know we don't we don't invade Europe and France with the Normandy invasions until 1944, which is two years after we two and a half years after we came into the war. So. There was You're just like, gun shy. I mean, there was, upon. There you just didn't want to get involved. There was a lot of politics. You, wow. you know, people were just trying to play it just right. Interesting. Yeah, you can find that story. So the the Times would do the Nazi atrocity stuff on the back pages, but they also denied it. I think there was a writer who denied it. The New York Times it. were Holocaust deniers. Well, I, to be fair, they were early money on Holocaust denying. You know, they yeah. were they were toward the beginning like, of the my Holocaust, God. and uh, they uh, they didn't use the word Jews. They would use refugees, and um, and I think one of the major guys who was in charge of that desk got a Pulitzer for it, but. You know, I'm hey, color me confused. All the guys who wrote about Russian collusion for three years, they got Pulitzers too. Mm. They don't. I guess they don't take that shit back when you turn out to be <laughs> wrong, wrong about your story. But uh, huh. yeah, they've been at it for for a while. So um, O'Reilly, how do you hook up with O'Reilly? And then, like, how's the process work? Does he go? I got an idea for a book. I'll get to work. He's pretty sure. So we once upon a time we had the same agent and and. Where he was looking uh, for a co-writer, and you know, we we met. We, you know, I flew to New York. We we sat down. I got the gig, and you know, it was supposed to be a one-off. It was just supposed to be killing Lincoln. And, mm-hmm. and with that book, you know, Bill had never done history before, and I'd written you know a fair amount of it. So he kind of left me alone for the first six months to to kind of uh, you know put a voice to it and figure out how we wanted to do it. So I kind of used the same format. For this, that I the, that I invented for that, which is, you know, the the story is told in the first person. It's short chapters, uh, cliffhanger endings. Really, really, you know, you want to keep turning the pages, that kind of stuff. Um, but then, when Killing Lincoln took off. I mean, it's sold like seven million copies now. And then we did Killing Kennedy, and then then we did Killing Jesus, and then we kind of just started working through it. And it's it's a pretty simple process. Well, I'll research and I'll write a narrative draft, and I'll email it to him. Actually, I sent it to his printer at his, at his house in in, uh, in Long Island. 
he'll mark it up, he'll read it out loud, then we get on the phone, and we combine my version and his, his version to make sure it's in his voice, and we edit, we, we add and delete. And, um, you know, we're on the phone like two or three times a week um, doing that kind of stuff. You know, having said that, we just finished the 12th one, and I took a, I was writing that one at the same time as I was writing Taking Berlin, so I was doing two books at the same time, which is a recipe for <laughs> stupidity. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, Would those sentences drift off into the other person's book? Well, the thing is, that was the hard part. First of all, the quality couldn't suffer. They mm-hmm. both they both had to be good, um, and I, I needed to have my my style be you know be distinctly different from Bill's. I didn't want people to finish it and say that you know Bill wrote this book mm-hmm. or I wrote the other book. And so, um, but then you know Bill's working on another killing book right now, and I'm taking a break from the series to focus on these. My wife's had some health issues. We're kind of focusing on that too. But um, it is nice to write in my own voice and, you know, kind of make my own mistakes and, and sure. find my way out of trouble. Let's talk travel uh, because I'm reading some interesting things here. Chris, you got to find that New York Times Holocaust. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. I thought, I'm going to need to we're see some it. proof on that. It's going to drive me nuts. We've got to give Gina proof. Yeah. Uh, it says here, set a world record for global circumnavigation. 30, I didn't even know you are Jewish. 31 <laughs> hours and 28 minutes in a Concorde. Yeah. Which, they, you know, they are they don't have Concorde yeah, That was kind of one and done. No, it was around. It was around for a while. For how, yeah. how long was that around? It, it was developed in the 60s, maybe even the yeah. late 50s. People don't know how fucking no. far back that shit no. goes. It probably started in the mid to later 60s and flew for, for years. I, I thought it was a much shorter window than that. No, it's about like 25 to 30 years. Oh, it wow. was around for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. you did it. Well, you know... Um, I was it was I was doing a lot of freelancing back then. A lot of what magazine, year was this? Nineteen ninety six. Wow! A friend tipped me off that that uh, Coors Light was sponsoring this around the world attempt to break the around the world speed record, and um, I called up a friend at Sports Illustrated. I got I got an assignment and which got me a seat on the plane, and we took off from New York and we went New York, Toulouse, Dubai, Bangkok, Guam, El Capulco, then back to New York, um, twice the speed of sound, and. <laughs> You know, we had to stop to refuel, but every uh, every leg was a seven course meal. It was an Air France Concorde, and um, the bathrooms were super tiny. But um, I was walking past, and one of the the guys on the flight was saying, "Have you ever seen people join the Mile High Club <laughs> in there?" And she said, "Yes, it was the same person going over to France and coming." back from France. So I don't know how they did. I mean, they're tiny. They're, they're tiny, tiny little needle. I mean, you probably, could you stand up fully in that plane? Kind You're of tall guy. You like in, in the main aisle, you could stand up, but everything else is more like a military plane with really, really thick fuselage and very, very small windows because it, you were at 60,000 feet. So you could see the curvature of the earth. Oh and it's like, you were kind of like one foot out in space. <laughs> Um, but I'll tell you that feeling of when they when they went through the sound barrier, it's just like something smacked the back of the plane and it just popped through. It was the coolest thing. Sonic boom. Yeah. And so that plane was around for a long time. It, until 2003. Yeah. It had a disastrous yeah. crash and that was the that. tire blew out or some piece of piece of uh, debris got sucked and blew yeah. out the tire and then got sucked into the engine. And then it just crashed on yeah. takeoff. I talked to a guy who did fly, and you you could get, I, I don't know, New York to Paris in three hours and uh, L.A. to New York in uh, yeah. two and a half or something, whatever. They, they, it made a sonic boom, right. so they had problems with that. What, what did it feel like at cruising altitude? Oh, totally smooth. It was, it was... You didn't have that sort of feeling like pulling you back? Oh, no, no, not at all. It just, it was one, and they had a mock meter at the front of the cabin, so it would... You could tell when you were about to go, get you know, point nine. Then, then they would dip the nose down a little bit to gain to gain airspeed going through the the sound barrier. Then it would pop through. But when it got to you know Mach two, in which is faster than a speeding bullet, you couldn't feel it go any faster. It was just, and it would, and the thing about it was when we landed, you know, we landed in New York. I live in Orange County. I had to take a regular 747. <laughs> the slowest thing on the planet. And it felt like we were walking down the runway. It was it was horrible. So did uh, so I heard that the guy who I was talking to, some producer, flew it from New York to L.A. Said uh, or maybe Paris, I can't remember. Said uh, the engines would kind of flame out on a on occasion, and they had to restart mm. them. 
by dipping down and gathering some speed and like re, like bump start the engines. Maybe I don't that's know. what happened. I thought it was just <laughs> I just thought it was how they went through this. You didn't experience yeah. any of that. And as, so you're on it for 31 hours and yeah. change. Because every time we we landed to get gas, we we get off the plane for about 45 minutes. And the thing about it was it was sponsored by Coors Light. So the people on the plane were it was myself. There was an astronaut who had flown around. He was held the previous record or the existing record, I should say. On Apollo 17, Kyle Petty, the race car driver who was sponsored by Coors Light, and everybody else was the the publicity and the marketing people for that particular campaign. And it was basically we had 31 hours of a of a nonstop party bus. It was, mm-hmm. it was you know, <laughs> you know it's just one of those things where there was no sleeping. It was just a lot of drinking, a lot of good food. Um, and as we landed. Um, the whole everyone was on their feet chanting one more lap. It was, it was oh really? Cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Seven course meals. Yeah. Now you get the pretzel sticks right. and the steak. Yes, eye. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, the people you should feel sorry for. It's not the frequent flyer of today. It's the people who remember back when, mm. when they would roll the that carts. ice cream cart yep. down the aisle, when they had the serving guy sharpening the knife with the <laughs> roast beef. The carving front. station. <laughs> carving station. Yeah. Oh, my God. Then they have like a little, like the DC-10 used to have a, a, a lounge at the front. You, you go up front, you sit in this lounge. and you know, The 747 had a pub. That's insane. That's cool. You'd go up. I never went to the pub, but you would go up a spiral staircase, go up top, and they had a bar and video games and stuff. And their thought had to be, if this is this cool now, wait till yeah, we get to like, 2020. It, we're going to be, be like? yeah, it's the, we're going to roll out the red carpet. We slowed down a little bit. Oof. And at some point, so the Concord was, all about speed and about people who would pay a premium to shave three hours off of their flight right. to Europe from New York. At some point, the dynamic changed and they realized, no, now we're going about how many souls can we pile into this thing at the cheapest price? Because uh, I did the math. I, you know, I don't know what a ticket cost on the Concorde from Paris to New York, but it had to be quadruple the price yeah. of a commercial airliner being in coach for sure but beyond that business or first class so at some point they just realized most people would rather pay 400 bucks and have it take twice as long than pay two twelve thousand pay twelve thousand dollars yeah. and shave three hours off you know I gotta say, every every seat in in the concord was a first class seat but they were narrow because it, it was a very very small cabin um but at the same time, you know, I remember William F. Buckley wrote something about flying the Concord, and it was just like a religious experience to him. And I think that the the day and age where people, this is I think before a lot of people flew private, so right they would they would do something like that rather than fly private. And I think I think if they did something like that again, you'd you'd find an audience because you know who's got the money to really own your own jet these days? Right. Well, you know the. You know, with this kind of space travel and space tourism and people paying, you know, millions of dollars to just go up and circle, circle, circle the globe up there in the atmosphere, it would seem like with all the rich folk and paying for these experiences, yeah, you'd think, you'd think there would be an opening for that. Yeah. And I don't know that there's any buddy Boeing or Airbus or whomever working on anything. I don't think they are, but no, I, you see yeah, renderings is, and stuff. Yeah, Boeing's got, it's like a hyperspeed jet. I'm not sure how that works, but they're talking about LA to Tokyo in like two hours. What? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, God, uh, hope it hits good. us in our time. Chris found some stuff on that, but it's didn't find, what'd you find? So uh, you're talking about Arthur Hayes Solzberger. Why? The, for the publisher for the New York Times. Well, I don't know that he was the the guy who wrote the articles. Well, no, but he was respond like I'll I'll explain. So he um and he did win the Pulitzer Pulitzer Prize in seventy two for publishing the Pentagon Papers. So he is a pra- he was a practicing Reformed Jew, but he took a stand against Zionism and a Jewish state of Israel based on principle and has been accused of uh, deliberately burying accounts of Nazi atrocities against Jews in the back page of the Times. 
and he went out of his way to play down the special victimhood of the Jews and withheld support for specific rescue programs for European Jews. Well, oh he was my a Jew. God! He's from the <laughs> tribe, <laughs> Gina. Hating, and that's the thing. Okay, be anti-Zionist, do your thing. But he literally, I'm guessing, probably a lot of people died because they didn't get there fast enough, and they what? He didn't want them to go to Israel. Well, I think what we're learning is whether you run Twitter. Whether you run the New York Times or whether you run Fox News, there's just no way to separate your personal feelings and beliefs from the product that ends up going out to the audience. But this wasn't in the op-ed section. This is what is going on. It's yeah. crazy. Well, it's – I you know – if you look no further than COVID, it's like people had a, made a decision. They took a stance and they said, "Here's here's what it is." I mean, g- you want to blow your mind? Go back two years, read all the Newsweek and USA Today Times, like the Great Barrington Declaration. It's a fraudulent group who make claims and uh, and and uh, false false facts about. It's like a, it's Orwellian, yeah. and you're just if you were just sitting home two two years ago reading USA Today or Newsweek, you'd be like, oh my god, these guys are fraudsters with a bunch of false. <laughs> yeah. They they claim masks aren't nearly as effective. They claim the shutting down schools and the false. False, false. Like, just go back. You don't have to go back 75 years. Just go back two years. 15 months. And read what all these major outlets were talking about. Anyone who had a differing account than Fauci on COVID. And you'll see the same shit going down. It's exactly the same. I don't know. It's sad, but that's that's where we live. Um, Sorry, Martin. Um, (laughs) So, Berlin. uh, You say... What, was it a wicked witch of the West kind of thing where after Hitler killed himself, the world, it just spread quickly and they just went, fuck it, we're laying our arms down? Pretty much. Because uh, they surrendered, the first the original surrender was to Montgomery on May 7th. The documents were signed on May 8th uh, in, in France. So it, it happened pretty fast. And everybody was trying, t- trying to flee the ship. Um, but, you know, kind of good, what you were just talking about, a lot of, I noticed, in this book, the the last year of the war, again, when we shifted the focus away from just invading France, but to actually getting, to, you know, trying to figure out what the post-war world was going to look like. And you had all this posturing between the Russians and, and Roosevelt and in in Great Britain. Um, a lot of the things that happened in that year, 1944, 1945, are still playing out now, you know, seven, all these years later. You, know, you, you see it in the Ukraine, you see it in and just in, in, in just so many things that came out of that, you know, you know, man on the moon came out of the the war. You know, uh, modern modern feminism. You know, women all of a sudden, you know, were in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Just all these different things that came out of that last year of the war. Well, it's an interesting tale. It's called "Taking Berlin: The Bloody Race to Defeat the Third Reich." Martin Ducard, uh, congratulations on being so uh, prolific, and we look forward to your uh, next effort. It's uh, the next week. You know, I like this too. It's it's taking London, but I was just over. Uh, so I flew the Concord th- with you know all those years ago. I got to fly in a Spitfire less, just about two months ago. Wow, that was the coolest thing ever. It was super fun. Yeah, man, yeah. that was quite a quite a battle. Yeah, so, and the Spitfire is one of the acclaimed planes with an elliptical wing. Yeah, really, it's got an elliptical wing. Like it, it made it, it very moves? tricky to fly. That's what <laughs> no. they. That's what they say. It was a revolutionary. It's just the shape of the wing was elliptical. Oh wow, that's yeah. see, I good, know good things. call. I like that. That's good. He knows. It's he knows. D, a D lot minus of... student at yeah. North Hollywood High. <laughs> yeah. D minus. <laughs> D minus. My entire scholastic career. Uh, Martin, thanks for uh, joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. And we're going to shift gears. Man, Crazy Bone from Bones, <laughs> Thugs, and Harmony are going to uh, join us, and we'll do that right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam. I just took out five extra long zip ties. I solved two problems around the house. I want to call you and get your feedback. Anything, any thoughts on the zip tie? How do you feel about the zip tie? Thank you. 
You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Crazy bonus here from Bone Thugs and Harmony. And I like the zip tie. I don't like when people remove the zip tie because there's certain things people never pick up. And that's when they clip the zip and it falls on the ground. Like they have a bunch of wires and electrician comes by, they clip. They will never... They're like cigarette butts. Yeah. But they, they don't think it's litter. They'll just fucking throw it anywhere. So I see cut zip ties all over the place all the time, even in my dreams. <laughs> you share my disdain for the cut zip tie? I Crazy you. bone? I hear you, man. I hear you. You feel my zip tie pain? I feel your pain. I know it affects the community. <laughs> yeah. I heard Michelle Obama talking about it the other day, so I, I, I'm down. Um, one, uh, one of the best, I don't know, um, bands, rappers, singers. Um, I always, I was actually listening. Do you guys remember being on Loveline, the radio show, like twenty something years ago when I was hosting? Uh, man, I'm not sure if I do. That was, I'm, I'm, I actually don't remember. It's a lifetime ago. It's all right. Yeah, I don't make an impression on that. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it was Howard Stern, you probably remember. But yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, to, uh, to be fair, uh, I was just uh, listening to Gio, who sent me a bunch of stuff, and ev- everyone was like, these guys rapped, but they sung, they harmonized. Yes. And that, that was different than kind of what you're seeing today, I guess. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Wait, it, it, was, it was even kind of, it was even different for when we, you know, for the time we came out, because nobody else was doing it. So it was very different. I think that's why a lot of people took to us like they did, because it was something fresh and it was like a breath of fresh air or something different. How did the band form? Uh, well, we um, uh, three other members are related. Two brothers. Uh, there's two mm-hmm. brothers and a cousin. And um, I met the I met the guys in seventh grade. So we actually been together since since junior high school. Oh damn! Ever do Soul Train? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so Don Cornelius could did ask. The Did brothers, if questions? they were brothers. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what what, now? what he, now? Apparent. We watched some clips. Don Cornelius liked to ask bands if they were related, and often oh, yeah. the answer was no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we was on it, and he asked, too. He asked oh, my too. God. <laughs> yeah. What are the odds? Very he consistent. Asked us too. <laughs> yes, indeed. He asked us, too. He was like, so any of your brothers? Or we like, wow. <laughs> yep. So you remember going on Soul Train, but you don't <laughs> remember going on Love Line. Different vibe. Adam, he wasn't on Love Line. You talked to the other guys on Love Line. Oh. Crazy oh. Geo? Sweet vindication. What did Geo say to me? <laughs> I, I know Lazy Bone was on, and okay. there were the other guys. But yeah, I, Geo oh. told me the other day that Crazy didn't go on Love Line. Oh, okay. well then. <laughs> you are so then dismissed. you're safe. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. I got my bone swap. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, you guys started just harmonizing or no. rapping? Like, what did what yeah. did you what? How did you kind of find each well, other? Well, um, what's crazy is we didn't even know when we met each other that our grandparents knew each other, ah. and our and our parents actually went to school together. So um, we had started hanging out with each other, and um, I just. My father took me over to Lazy Bone's house one day, and when he saw his mom, he was like, they called each other by name, they already knew each other. So we started hanging out on a daily basis. We started entering school talent shows. And back then we were called, in junior high, we had, we, we had a group we were called the Band-Aid Boys. <laughs> and we used to walk around with Band-Aids up under our eyes, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's where it all started from. And, we st- and we've been together ever since. Two different names, different group names, different rap names, but we've been together since... Junior high school, pretty much. <clears throat> who did the band aid under the eye? Who Nelly did? Nelly, mm-hmm. who's for his brother who was in prison. I saw an Entertainment Tonight, like two thousand and two <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah, I don't know why I did. I, I just so Nelly it. ripped off your band aid boy thing. <laughs> man, man, that's what, we just tell everybody we used to do that way back in junior high school. They also used to walk around with giant clocks around their neck. Oh, oh like yeah. Flavor Flav. Sure well, did. well, Before, who? Yeah, right. Who's right. Who? Yeah. So when did it uh, when did it start taking off then? Are you guys out of Cleveland yes, area? Yes, out of Cleveland. I Man, it started taking off. We we had just about ex- exhausted all our all our um, avenues there. You know, the music scene wasn't that big there, and we were huge hip hop fans. We loved New York hip hop, but we gravitated more to the West Coast hip hop, and so we were we were big fans of N.W.A. and Eazy-E. And around the time that we saw 
NWA split up and Easy went his way and Dr. Dre and everybody. We always said we what we said we want to go to California and help Easy out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because he's the underdog now. Everybody turned against him. We like we want to be signed to Ruthless. And we actually told people when we left Cleveland, when we come back, we coming back with Easy E and a video crew, and that's exactly what we did. Oh my God. <laughs> But so, did you give them um, demo tapes and stuff like so, that? So, so while we were out here, <clears throat> we had a um, we had a local album that we had, uh, that we released in Cleveland. It's called Faces of Death, and um, <clears throat> the person who worked with us in Cleveland gave us the number to Ruthless Records. We actually took one way bus tickets out here. We was like, it's do or die. We either go now or our dream is gonna pass. And About so, how old were you? <clears throat> we were like. Busy was the youngest. He was like 16. Wow. And and I was 18. Yeah. Wow. Yes, we was between 16 and 18 at the time. And um, we got on a one-way bus and um, came out here. We didn't know what we was going to expect, where we was going to stay at. <laughs> Luckily, we had some people who was from Cleveland. They were going to school out here. So we stayed. It was like seven of us in one bedroom apartment. <laughs> and um, our our contact back home gave us the number to Ruthless Records, so we started calling every single day, every single day. Like we want to speak to Easy, and so the secretary one day, she was like, "You know what? I'm so tired of y'all calling me. I'm gonna make sure Eric calls y'all back today." And we was like, "Cool." So we stayed by the phone, and the phone rang, and it was Easy, and he was like, um, "Busy answered the phone." He was just so excited. He was like, "Oh my God, hold on!" And he threw the phone to me, and he was like, "Rap." <laughs> Rap for him. And I just started rapping, and he was like, hold on one second. And then he put me on hold, and then he came out to the phone and said, say that rap you just said again. And I could hear other people in the room. I think it was Jerry Heller and like a oh lot of other, other artists was in there. And after I finished rapping, they was like, wow. And then he was like, where y'all from? He was like, Cleveland. And he said, I got a show in Cleveland in two weeks. And then he was like, how much rapping did you do on the phone? And I, what was the rap? It was a rap that I uh, did, man. It, it was, it was like a fast rap. It was like, um, what can I say it now? Sure. I don't remember all of it. It was like, well, it's the killer, the killer, the killer that wants to get the suckers. They pick up their pen and instead of contempt, say go that they win. It's that man ten that's blasting. Pick up the good of you with enough a nigga sass and popping the clip and you asking who in the hell was that mass man? Something like that. And he was just like, that sounds was, like Martin the Guard. But it was longer than that, though. It was longer <laughs> and. They threw you the phone, yeah, because you were kind of the Cracker Jack uh, rapper, the like the the better. I shouldn't have said Cracker. No, no, no. <laughs> That's what I mean is, they yeah. knew you were the one to sell for thirty seconds out of yeah. all the guys. Yeah, it was kind of and busy. Flattering. Busy, busy was new in the group at the time. You know what I'm saying? So he, mm-hmm. we let him in the group. So he get he was like rap for him. That's easy. <laughs> And I was like, I just got the phone to start rapping. You know what I'm saying? It just. So, do you have to get on a one way bus back to Cleveland to open? That's the thing. He said, I got a show in Cleveland. In Cleveland. And um, uh, he was like, if y'all, if y'all, will, will y'all be able to make it back there? And we was like, we'll try. So, we hung up the phone with him. Now, first of all, he told us he was going to call us back in two, two hours. But the people we were staying with at the time, for some reason, the the female left the house and she locked the phone in her bedroom. Oh, no. So we hearing the phone ring all day. Oh, like, my ah! God. This we is like, like a bad sitcom episode. We like, should we bust it down or what? Should we bust it? <laughs> this is our future. We was like, man, if we bust it down, we ain't going to know where to stay. So we was like, he said he was going to Cleveland. Let's just try to get back to Cleveland. So we called our contact in Cleveland and told him, if we come back to Cleveland, can you get us an opening spot on this easy show? He said, I'm promoting that show. Done deal. So we hustled up money, called our family, like, cried. We stranded. We can't get back home. <laughs> you know what I'm we have a good reason. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and they helped us get back home. And, and the show that he had was actually at a um, nightclub that Levert owned, the group Levert. They owned the um, club. It's called Vert's Nightclub. And we, uh, we went in. We opened up for Easy. Then after um, Easy went on, we, we just blended with them like we were part of their entourage. And just walked to the backstage area, but they stopped us at the dressing room. Wait, hold on, wait. Who was y'all? And Yellow Boy came outside and we was like, man, can we rap for you? And he was like, yeah, go ahead. So we started saying the same rap I said on the phone, and Easy stuck his head up and was like, y'all the ones I talked to on the phone? And he was like, yeah. He was like, came out and talked to us. And uh, he was like, when y'all trying to leave? He was like, now? 
We ain't got no clothes to take. We ain't got no bags to pack. We ready to go now. And he was like, I'll call y'all in the morning. He called us and he had like bus tickets set up for us to get back to California. And he said, I'll see y'all when I get back. It's such a weird pre-cell phone yes. time when you yes. have to stand by the phone. Yeah. You'd yes. even do the move. I don't know if you guys did this move, but when you were expecting a call, but you had to go take a shower or something, you take the phone off the hook mm-hmm. so they get the busy signal. Oh, smart. So they would call back in sure. 10 minutes. Sure. That The busy signal was kind of code for you just call back in 10. I got to run out to the liquor store. I'm coming back. I take exactly. the phone got off it. the hook. Got it. Exactly. It's it's a, it's also weird how analog and and uh, archaic archaic it was, but on the other hand, it somehow worked. Yeah, it did. Although it did. you guys essentially took a four day bus trip to Los Angeles <laughs> yes. to make a phone call you could have made from Cleveland, exactly, and then <laughs> took another four days it's back. Way to better story, exactly. Cleveland. But this yeah. is a better this yeah. is a better story. Yeah, it is. So now you get to L. A. and and what? And we get there, we get, um, Easy was still on tour. He came like, came back two days later. What year is this, sorry? This was like, um, this was 93, Mm -hmm. 93. And he was on tour. So when he came back to LA, he just, he came to the hotel room and he picked us up and we, he, he, he took us to the studio immediately. He took us to like three different studios in one day. And we did like three songs that day. But the last studio we went to, the uh, the producer was DJ Unique, the one who produced all of our music. We stuck with him because when we met up with him, his vibe matched ours like completely. Everything we told him, how we wanted our music to sound, he made it sound exactly like that. So, Easy just put us right to work. He put us right to work, and um, we were we were working on the album, but he was so anxious to get us out. He was like, "No, let's take these six songs, creeping on to come up as an EP. Let's put it out now." And he put it out, and like. Weeks later, it was it was crazy. <laughs> and did you keep going back on the road with him? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. He 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 kept us with him. Like he kept us like everywhere he went, we was right there with him. That's amazing. Everywhere. Do you remember when he got sick? Yes, yes. I remember when he got sick. It was it, it was kind of strange because it's just kind of like he had disappeared. Like we we were in um we were out here staying in hotels and like you know we we weren't from here, so we was like he would disappear like. Like weeks sometime and 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 we in the hotel with no food, no money, and we told him like we we caught up with him one time. We was like, bro, just you know, <clears throat> if you busy right now, send us back to Cleveland so at least we have ways to hustle and make money to feed ourselves. Like we're not from here, we don't we don't know the codes out here. You know what I'm saying? So we need to be somewhere where we're we're comfortable. And then he was that's when he um put out a photo and he was like, look, I'm making some changes in my company getting rid of a lot of people, and I need y'all to just be patient because I'm rebuilding with y'all. Mm. And we was like, that's all you had to tell us, bro. <laughs> we down. That's all you had to tell us. And so, like, weeks later, he disappeared again, and we got a call to come up to the office, to Ruthless Records. And there was an attorney there named Ron Sweeney. And uh, they had checks for us. And we was like, where is Easy at? And they were like, um, Easy's taking care of something right now, da, 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 da. but he wanted us to give y'all these advancement checks, you know, advance checks. So we got the checks, and we um, we all moved back to Cleveland, like got houses and so took it was a check, of, like oh, a good oh, check. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it was a check we ain't never seen before. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we go home and, you know, like get houses and, you know, like, um, set ourselves up. And in the midst of that, two weeks after I get back home, the um the girl I was with at the time, she was from here, and she got a call from her friend saying, "Have you heard anything about Easy E getting sick with um HIV?" And I was like, "No," <laughs> but the very next day it came on MTV News confirming it, and I was like, "Wow!" So that's how we found out on MTV News. After that, we was we was kind of like shut out of all that. Like nobody told us nothing. What happened? All we know is that he had AIDS. A couple weeks later, he was dead. So oh my God. we was like, "What?" Well, Back to the streets for us. And that was your that was your mentor. That was your guy. Yeah. And he was just gone. Oh yeah. Yeah, we we had been and and we wasn't even with him for like a full year. Oh my God. But the times we was with him, like he was with us every day. Like he was staying in our in our little apartment. He would fall asleep in our little apartment, you know what I'm saying? Like just like like with us all the time. Wow. Yeah, it was a death sentence back then. 
Oh, yeah. Now, definitely not so much, but yeah. it's such a luck of the draw because you get it now. You see commercial. I see a lot of commercials yeah. for AIDS medications. Exactly. People are going about their business. And that was getting toward the end of the death sentence. Like a couple of years later, probably AZT, AZT and yeah. he'd probably still still be around yeah so real. now your your mentor's gone yeah practically I, he was in his 30s yeah yep. young yep in his 30s and uh that definitely <clears throat> slowed your roll a little bit but how'd you guys pick it up after that well we thought it ended our role <laughs> you know what i'm saying so because we was like man we just we just got on with the dude we wanted to get on with our our childhood dream and now it's just like gone but then we get a call from Ruthless Records, <clears throat> and they wanted to have a meeting with us. So they flew us back from Cleveland, and we go to the office, and it's his wife in the office now. So, you know, we immediately it's probably, it's like was, like, biased. Like, who right. is you? Right. Where is easy? You know what I'm saying? Like, this ain't, you know what I'm saying? Because, because we have found out that they dropped just about every other artist on the label but Bone. I was like, wow. I was like... And everybody else was looking at it. You know, the other artists, they was mad, but they was, like, kind of telling us, like, y'all need to watch out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Y'all need to watch out. Did she make that decision? Um, I don't, from what I hear, Easy said, whatever you do, don't don't let them go. Wow. Wow. That's from what I what what, what we heard. Yeah. Well, I would say that's probably what he said. Yeah. Because that's, oh, yeah. that's what happened. Definitely. So, now, you guys knew that you had something, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... It doesn't mean things are going to work out, but you definitely know you have ability yeah. and you were able to impress people. Oh, yeah. So she carries on the company, Easy's wife, after he passes on. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting into, I mean, we're 95, 96. Yeah. And then you guys are going into the studio again or you're going out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, he actually passed away in the midst of us while we were working on our first album. You know, we did the EP, and then we, we were working on our album, Eternal. And um, they kept, like, he was supposed to come to the studio, like, to, to to be on that album, but he never came. And we was like, yo, what's going on? He's not even showing up for the album. And, you know, and then that's when we, we found out what was going on. But, um, you know, we kept pushing, like, you know, like, the our, our success, like, still, it, it, it took off in the midst of all this. Like, we were steady going up, even though all the turmoil at the, label our success was steady rising we didn't know it but it was steady rising like on the radio and the charts and mm -hmm. stuff like that yeah do you remember the first time i know it's a cliche trope but for a reason the first time you heard your song on the radio yeah man yes i remember easy called us one day and he was like we was in a hotel room he's like turn the radio on <laughs> and we turned the little clock radio on like <laughs> and we heard thuggish ruggish bone yeah we was like all through the hotel room, we we called people in Cleveland. Like, look, we on the radio in L.A. <laughs> like, 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 we was man, it was crazy. The feeling was crazy. Like, it was so much energy. We was like, wow, we finally made it. It was crazy. I love that. I love that story. I should ask every single band that. Yeah. Gina, rem remind me. I will. Because it, it's so it's it'll because you know maybe it's like the second date with the, the relationship that may be a little bit sour now, but it'll never get better than that. Yeah. You, That's true. <laughs> there's more money and there's yeah. more accolades and there's more events Same. and there's more you running into folks you respect and yeah. all that shit. But that for purity, I'd say it's just that one That's moment, moment. Yeah. on, on the, uh, Radio, because then after that, it, it, it'll turn into a business. Exactly. And once it turns into a business, it's, <laughs> it's a the business. Purity then it's just, sort it's of just evaporates. It's just work. Yeah, yeah it's just work for real. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And and also, you can never. I mean, it's 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 kind of like saying to a. It's kind of like a race car driver saying, "Like, what's the funnest and fastest you've ever gone?" And they'd say, "When I was eight on a sled." Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but you've gone 200 miles an hour at Talladega, but it was that moment on the sled. Mm -hmm. It just didn't, I didn't Clenched get paid. It didn't yeah. get any better than exactly. that. That's yeah. how we are as human beings. I should uh, plug the podcast, by the way, Truth Talks, and you can watch it on YouTube. Let's uh, talk about that. And the foundation, Spread the Love Foundation as well. We should talk about that. 
Well, let's go with the foundation first. Okay. Spread the love foundation. Because you're still very, you're still tied to Cleveland and oh, that yeah. whole area. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spread the love is something that, you know that I've been wanting to do. I've actually been wanting to do it ever since we got on with Easy. But you know, I didn't have the knowledge, mm-hmm. or I would see other people's nonprofits, and then when I saw some people who were doing their nonprofits the wrong way and getting <laughs> going, I was like, wait, wait, I gotta make sure I understand this. <laughs> To the fullest, because I'm not trying to be sitting in jail for some one of y'all and telling you, you know what I'm saying, and they put it on me. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, so spread the love is something I'm doing. Um, I'm actually um, in the process of acquiring my my old elementary school. It, it was it was torn down, but I'm trying to I'm I'm purchasing the lot right now to build a a Bone Thugs and Harmony Academy to teach kids music skills, to teach them business skills, to teach them just. All the ins and outs and arounds of the oh, business. That's awesome. You know what I'm saying? I I love that thought. I'm always I hate big everything. I hate teachers' unions and big education and the fact that L. A. was shut down for two years. It shut the schools down. I like the LeBron James Academy. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the, I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Kanye West, yeah. you know, I still like what's behind it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, yeah. He doesn't have to coach Jim over there or, or civics classes, right. but, you know, I like he's doing his they own thing. They have parkour. Thing. Oh, they do. They do have parkour, yeah. They uh, also, then, it, Chris, I'm going to think of the guy's name I can't think of right now. The uh, drummer for Lenny Kravitz, who's been in here, is a friend of mine. I'm spacing out right now. I owe him a text, but... Uh, he went back to his. I wish everyone would just go back to where they're from and start an academy and start a school. I, yeah. I it's basically Elon Musk with SpaceX. Like you can <laughs> give NASA two hundred kajillion dollars and wait twenty years, or, or or this guy can do it at a fraction of the cost and ten times faster yeah. and get better <laughs> results out of it. I kind yeah. of feel that way. But how? Oh, Franklin Vanderbilt. That's that's who I'm trying to think of. Um, how do you go about doing that? Well, um, I've been in... And what is this school? Sorry, but go ahead. I, I, um, I've been in conversations with the city. I've had uh, several meetings with the you know the councilmen, the, the mayor. I actually have a meeting with the mayor next week in Cleveland, you know, to um, talk about, you know, further funding for the project and stuff like that. So, I mean, it, was just, it, it, it just took us to, like, you know, gather the city, let, let the community know what the plans were and... Everybody got behind us. We we actually just did a uh, coat drive the other day on Saturday, and it was a great great turnout. Like people, and it just got cold, and the day after we got a foot of snow in Cleveland, so it was it was right right on time. So people love that you are still tied to the community. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. They get excited about all the stuff you're doing. Every time we go back and they see stuff that we're doing, especially in the community, it like it like lifts them up. They're they're happy we still represent the where you know where we came from. Mm-hmm. The same neighborhood the same block and I'm, I'm i'm about to try to build it up as much as i can well, speaking of lebron james he loves you guys oh yeah oh yeah neighbors that's the homie, <laughs> that's the homie. oh yeah oh that's right yeah definitely yep 20 minutes away Ac- acting like 20 minutes away from Cleveland. <laughs> oh yeah yeah now i'm doing the math yeah mm-hmm. that guy moves around so much i can i <laughs> never figure out where he's from he's nomadic yeah. but he yeah. yeah he's out there yep i bet Drew Carey loves you guys. Oh yeah, Arsenio. <laughs> oh yeah, Arsenio. Yes, indeed. Uh, Arsenio had us on the show. He was hyped, so he was like real hype. <laughs> Drew Carey is a fan. You know what I'm saying? Spoke to him like a few years ago. It's it's, it's cool. I can't think of anyone else as famous I know. from Ohio. That's all I got. Woody Hayes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he died. I mean, it's a lot of people. If, if if you put in artists and celebrities from Cleveland, you'd be shocked who come up. Like it's crazy. I did it one time, and I was like, wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> Not I, just me? I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's exactly. see who, who we got. Phil Donahue. Halle Berry. Yeah. Halle Berry. Terrence Howard. Kid Cootie. Yeah. Paul Newman. Oh, yeah. Hello. Shaker Heights. Yeah. Where's Harvey. Shaker Heights? You know where Shaker Heights oh, is? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shaker Paul Heights. Newman's from Shaker Heights. Have you ever met Tracy Chapman? Man, no, I have not. And when I found out she was from Cleveland, I was like, I never knew that. That I, I first time hearing knew. of it. Never knew Steve that. Steve Harvey, Terrence Howard, Molly yeah. Shannon. Wow, it, this is a long ass list. Yeah. Hmm. Impressive. Punch in North Hollywood, California. No. Let's see. Just Benny. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, where is Franklin Vanderbilt wanting to build his school? I can't. Uh, 
By the way, I don't know what the theme is, but it appears to be all brothers. Franklin Vanderbilt. We got the LeBron. Like Don Cornelius brothers? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, men of color, African American or something, giving back to the neighborhood. I don't hear George Clooney doing this stuff. Mm. Maybe it's just me. Now, (laughs) since you're so good at, you have such a storied record of saying, I'm going to do this and accomplishing it, what do you think, uh, how long do you think it'll take to get this up and running? Um, Well, we've been, we actually started, we had just started the whole process in 2019. And after I made the first visit and met with the, uh, you know, the Cleveland uh, members down there on on the mayor's team, Mm -hmm. right after I returned, COVID hit. Yep. And that knocked us out. But but with the help of Zoom, we were able to get a lot done because we stayed on like weekly meetings on Zoom. Sure. We stayed on those meetings to, 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 to push whatever we could push. So now, with everything open and I've been going, we're looking like up, hopefully um, mid next year to start building. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. Oh, yes. wow. So are you going kind of ground up? Or are you taking over an old coat hanger factory or something? No, ground up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to cost something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, we, 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 we um, you know, we going through, like, see what kind of grants and, you know, they're going to grant us and stuff like that. And we do is, it all, is it all going to be music, arts, and performance based? Or is it going to no. be a scholastic No, curriculum? it's going to be, I want to, you know, I want to, not only do I want to teach people, you know, just uh, music skills and music industry knowledge, I want to teach, pe- you know, life skills as well. You know, like get it, talk to the young, young um uh, Boys coming up in, in the neighborhood, you know, trying to steer them in the right direction. And young girls, too, you know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to do it like however however we can spread the love. Mm. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Well, again, I'll give the foundation out. Spread the Love Foundation. You can visit spreadtheloveoh.com. All right. Uh, Crazy Bone, you want to hang out with us? We'll do we'll take a quick break and do the news. Yes, indeed. We'll do that right after this. So now that Karen Bass has been elected mayor of L.A., she says she does want to hit the ground running on certain issues affecting the city. So I'm just going to show you, if you haven't seen it, here's a one-on-one interview she did with ABC7 talking about what she wants to happen when she takes over in just a couple of weeks. The campaign is over and it's time to get to work. So what does Mayor-elect Karen Bass have in store for Los Angeles? We are definitely going to identify some of the most challenging encampments and make sure that we can get those people housed. But declaring a state of emergency really allows us to rally, bring together the city agencies, and allows us to look at especially city-owned land and fast-track things. What happened to Garcetti? And I was thinking about this the other day. He was the former mayor. I know you're into Cleveland politics, but this is L.A. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about? I had this thought. Eric Garcetti, why the fuck did you want to be mayor? Like, mm-hmm. what is the ambition? Like, to go, like, like go, you know, all I want to do is fly this airplane. That's all I want to do. And then they put you up in the pilot's f- flight deck, and you go, eh. Eh, I'm bored. I'm not as into it as I thought. I'm I'd heading be. to the back. Yeah. We use the bathroom. Like, why did Garcetti want to be mayor? He didn't do anything. He was never around. Uh, uh, nothing changed. It, it, just, it just everything just got sort of slowly w- worse. It, it, more trash. More homelessness. Like more crime. Like, but but really at its core, why do you want to do this? Then I mean, I get it's a cool title <laughs> to be mayor of Los Angeles, but then. You kind of show up and you're like, eh. he didn't do a. He, I didn't hear him interviewed a lot. I didn't hear like a lot of proclamations. I didn't hear. I didn't. There wasn't like, but you know, by 2021, <laughs> we're going to. It was nothing. No. Just kind of showed up and then, at the end, he was just sort of like, well, no one really liked me, and I'm thinking about India, and I want to be the ambassador, That's right. and so gonna I'm just go. going to kind of lay low for the next six months, and yeah. you guys sort of take over, but. Like, I would like to get him really high and just go, what did you want to do? Like, what, what was, was the, the plan? plan? <laughs> what, what did you want to do? Because you didn't do any of it, but did you want to do it or did you just want to kind of hobnob? Well, because take, for instance, Crazy Bone. When he says he's going to do shit, he does shit. What was Look, your plan? I would work Crazy Bone into that You'd conversation. Have to. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when you're declaring a state of emergency, here's some of the stuff that happens. Wait, we yeah. have, there's a story I was looking for, Chris. Maybe it's a New York Times one, but there's... One where 
somebody, some council person wants to get rid of internal combustion automobiles, and the other one is working on something that's not going to work for homelessness. But anyway, yeah. So you you so Caruso wanted to do this too. He wanted to do a state of emergency, right? And then what? So that gives. It, it 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 triggers immediate uh, emergency regulations into effect, whatever those are. A lot of police power and a lot of funding. So we don't know what she's going to do with that. She hinted at you know give the unhoused houses, but we know it's way deeper than that. And I guess we'll just have to see. Well, okay, couple things. You can't let things metastasize. You know, you catch that first cancer cell and you fucking jump on it. The first time someone pulls up in a Winnebago and parks it in front of the Hollywood Bowl, you have to jump on that. Because at a certain point, it, it becomes overwhelming. Now it's a throng. It's, it's a mass of humanity. And it's much less manageable. Like You, just you have, don't have the manpower to figure it out. You just that. have to hop on that. Immediately. And then, you know, the self-proclaimed homeless advocates, who are these people? Who's paying these people? Why do you get to be an expert on homelessness? None of your suggestions have done anything except for exacerbate the problem. Maybe you're not an expert. Like, could you imagine if a homeless expert was your veterinarian? It's like, yeah, everyone brings their dog in, dies. But don't you worry. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Don't you question me. I've anointed myself an advocate. Well, and that's sort of the thing I never understood. Like when they were, quote unquote, cleaning up Echo Park and, you know, trying to you know give that back to the neighborhood. And then they said, absolutely not. My first thought is, so it's it's good enough that these people live out the rest of their days in these encampments and and being sick or being drug users when there are programs we could put into effect to actually raise them up. This is good enough for you. We don't do this to animals. Why is this good enough for people? Yeah, the uh, city councilman, Paul Cortez, is seeking to ban the sale of new gas cars in L.A. Oh. by 3030. Again. Well, we're all independently wealthy, so it'll be fine. These are rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. People are going to leave way before that if you don't get the homeless thing, crime and everything, and trash. How, by the way, how could you not have a trash issue you have tens of thousands of homeless people living on the street. Of course, there's going to be a trash issue. What are they supposed to do with their trash? And their home and encampment is a form of trash. Well, and like Dr. Drew said how many years ago that it's, uh, what is it? Not the plague. Uh, the bubonic plague? Was yeah. that it? It's because of the trash and then the rats and then the fleas stay on the rats and then we all get the plague. Yes. That's fun. You're local here, yes? Yes. So yes, you, you, oh, oh, yeah. you're I, familiar. I, I see it all happen. I'm like, yes. And that's the question, like with the officials. It's like, where do you live? Because this is everywhere. Yes, acting like it doesn't exist. Well, there's a law. It needs to be enforced. I don't know why we turned a blind eye to basically, we have no camping ordinances. You're not allowed just to camp on the beach overnight. But, the hell you're not. <laughs> well, now you can camp next to the on the boardwalk. But either way, it's got to be cleaned up. And and now it's going to sting. Mm. Because, again, back to the cancer metaphor. Get it early. It, you, you may, it may not be that disruptive. We're getting the scalpel out now. Yeah. Like, we're going to have to it's start carving out parts. You're going to lose a lung. Like, we <laughs> let it go. We let it metastasize. And now we're getting into some deep surgery here. But... It still needs to be done. Yeah. So we'll uh, look forward to see what, what Ms. Baz does about that. Um, something that I, I think you, Adam, may have been expecting, but the rest of us weren't. If you're someone who thinks that smoking marijuana isn't as bad for you as smoking cigarettes because it's not addictive, here's some new news for you. Researchers from the Radiological Society of North America were comparing lungs of weed smokers, tobacco smokers, and non-smokers, and concluded that smoking marijuana is more harmful to your lungs than cigarettes. But there's a very, to me, when I read it, I was like, of course, obvious reason why that might be. Your harsh and crazy bones melt <laughs> right now. But I, I'm, just gonna give you a, I'm just going to give you a, an alternative that might help. Uh, the study shows that the rates of emphysema, airway inflammation, and enlarged breast tissue were higher in marijuana than in tobacco smokers. Doctors believe the major factor of the emphysema is that marijuana smokers just breathe more deeply, 
hold it longer, and that's causing a lot more damage yeah. inside when you're trying to get, you know, yeah. get more bang for your buck. I believe that. Yeah. Time to go <laughs> edibles, right? You go edibles, maybe exactly. a vape, some oh, vegetable you, glycerin. You know, I can't be inventing this, but they have a nicotine patch. Well, there's CBD lotions and stuff. I don't know about Is THC. there like a THC patch for like a long flight? God, that would fuck me up. Yeah. Somebody got to get on that shit. That's a good idea. I think a THC <laughs> patch for a long flight sounds like a very bad idea. That's some like <laughs> John you, Lithgow, <laughs> gremlins on the wing type shit. Well, that's because you're lightweight. <laughs> that's what I am these days. But for the guys in the band. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, need the extra punch. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess you can... Uh, I guess you can eat a gummy or something now. I remember once Jimmy packed a pot cookie for us because oh. he would get uh, air sick. Yeah. And uh, the pot cookie helped for air sickness. Sure. And I remember we were sitting up there in first class and he handed me one of the cookies and I was like, all right, I'm down. <laughs> and I started eating the cookie and he's like, no. The stewardess is like the stewardess was coming by, like he was like, no, not in front of. The, and I was like, if I put my jacket over my head and eat this cookie, <laughs> she's gonna know <laughs> right now. Yeah, I can pass cookie. this off as a Mrs. Fields, <laughs> exactly. But if I put the jacket over my head, she's gonna know something's up. <laughs> so I'm just gonna point. sit here in broad daylight and eat this cookie. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Crazy bones. Any stories that you'd like to impart? Any wisdom, maybe from the. From any any weed smoking, anything edibles that you'd like us to know? I mean, I know the first, uh, I don't um, necessarily do the edibles before I take a flight because I did it one time. Yeah. And it was, man, it was. I was so paranoid. That's what I'm talking about. I thought about, before the plane even took off, I was like, what if we don't make it there? <laughs> <laughs> All kind of stuff going through my head, like final destination. I'm like, man, I'm like, wait. I'm yeah. not doing this no more. <laughs> See Liam Neeson no walking more. down the aisle talking on his phone, and you're like, That's shit, right. it's on. Yeah. Not a, not a great plan. Well, it's if you're – some people get really paranoid and fixated and, and yeah. whatever. I mean, that's why – you can never ignore booze because it's it's always the same outcome. It's always there you're, for you. You're going to yeah. get relaxed. Yeah. You're not going to care nearly as much about whatever. <laughs> and at some point, you'll just pass out sure. and you'll wake up in New York or Chicago or yeah. Ohio. And that, that'll that'll be that. So you never yeah. sleep on booze. But it does make sense if you're ripping bong loads and holding it in as long as you possibly can. Yeah. There's going to be a little, a little damage. And cigarettes, it's... We, we always talk about this. Like everyone gets so caught up in the nicotine. Nicotine's not bad for you. Just like caffeine is not bad for you. It's just sort of inert. It's the smoke that's yeah. bad for and the you. The formaldehyde or whatever else they're putting in. Whatever it. else they're putting in there. Um, I've been meaning to talk about this for a while, so I can't wait to get your opinions on this, especially if you've ever heard of her. Uh, if you're tired of making your own decisions, you can do what this 23-year-old French chick has done. She's letting her OnlyFans followers make all of her decisions. Like, that's mm. what they're paying to like, do. take your panties off? That's right. Uh, everything from what to eat for lunch, who mm. to date. The woman goes by Lori. We have a picture of her, a very attractive woman. Wrote in her bio, no, this is not a joke. As of today, I have decided that I will no longer make the important decisions in my life. It's up to you. You choose the future of this account. Her ideas suddenly made uh, one, her one of the most popular content creators on OnlyFans. She says so far she's wor it's worked out well. People have actually like tried to give her good advice. They've mm -hmm. advised her to get out of a toxic relationship, to leave a bad job, to conquer a fear of heights by flying in a helicopter. So nothing... Nothing sadistic yet. Yet. That's yet. So there's a new, if you're just a hot blonde chick, that's just a job now, right? That's a job. Right? Yeah. That's your gig. That's your income source. Like you used to have to get a job as a receptionist yeah. and then hook up with the boss and then that could be your job. But now you don't have to leave the house. No. You just hang out and be hot. Live your life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or you can fart into a jar and sell that to German guys. You or... know that's true, yes. That's a real girl, fart jar girl. I saw that. I heard, yeah. yes, yes. And she crazy. didn't she like blow her colon out? 
she had some what? medical issues. Yeah. <laughs> you know. That is crazy. Well, yeah. she's, she's overworked. A- she's an athlete. You're going to have sure. injuries. Absolutely. You got to rub some dirt on it and get back out on that field. We <laughs> talked to I'm her. Saying. I liked her. <laughs> I liked her too. <laughs> but I think she went to selling other things. Oh. Yeah, she went to like NFTs, uh, digital fart work, she called it. And then, <laughs> what? and then, um, and then after that, I think she's like selling like her boob sweat. Oh, yeah, she's yeah, selling boob sweat. Yeah. yeah, I could have done that a year ago. That. Yeah, you missed out. That been easy. This whole bonanza boob sweat. Mm. And uh, yeah, so this is just a hot chick. So th- yeah. that's how she makes her living now. You know what? I don't know if this is still what they're doing. It's, it's kind of weird when you think about these OnlyFans chicks and guys and whatever, whatever. You used to have, if you're a hot chick and you didn't feel like working, you'd get one sugar daddy. Sure. Now you have 2,000 sugar daddies. Right. And they all give you $11 a month, <laughs> and you'll be fine. Like, I'm going to explain that to my daughter. You can get one sugar daddy yeah. and hit him up for the whole nut every every month, or you can spread it out. And then you don't need a rich old guy to be your sugar daddy anymore because you can have a bunch of sugar daddies who work normal jobs. This is your parenting plan? Part of it. <laughs> it's not the entire plan. I want I would, them in the academy. I, I would say transfer. she's probably, you probably make more money with the, the sugar daddy, but less physical contact with the e daddies mm. probably for the best yeah but, but the sugar daddies if you can get enough daddies yeah. under the tent you can make some good cash i can't argue with that yeah no one can every yeah. hot girl that i was friends with when i first moved out here they all had the same job they were all like bottle promo girls at events bottle service no like like oh we're working for Michelob th- today and we're going mm. out to the whatever mm. and we're handing out beer and like I guess that's what hot girls do I wasn't the hot I wasn't girl, asked the former hot girl job was the model who stood next to the car at the yes. auto show yes, yes. yeah that's like the 80s hot girl I would always <laughs> strike up a conversation with them because she's used to that they'd they had their sh- Dick, their oh, spiel. Oh, you. Do you come with that car? No. Oh, you. I literally <laughs> saw that on The Simpsons That's last exactly night. That's exactly why I said it. <laughs> they, no, they would do the beginning where they go, the 1989 Jeep Wrangler has uh, 444 rear gears and 12 inches of suspension travel and a 3.2 liter inline six engine with 186 foot pounds of torque. Because that was the shit they had to remember. Oh, wow. They could get that part. Right. But then no if you started questions. talking to them about anything else that had to do with that Jeep Wrangler, they didn't know jack squat. Whoa. And you, you'd press them on it? Yeah, I would. Yeah, that's awfully mean. Yeah. You know, it's part of their job. Sure. They're Are you a car guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love cars. I love cars. Well, what's your favorite or what do you have that you love? Well, man, I've had, I've had like a lot... My favorite car is the Mercedes Benz. I like that. You know what I'm saying? More than like Bentleys and stuff mm. like that. Because I like, I don't like like to draw too much attention. I just like something nice that can move fast. You know what I'm saying? And you know what I'm saying? But but I like truck. I I love trucks though. SUVs. You know, Escalades. Uh, the the tie holes. You know what I'm saying? Like Off roading or just to have? Just to have. Have um, you got them pimped out? Uh no 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 I, I mean, you know I stopped doing that to my cars like like years ago I'm like you know what I'm too old for this I <laughs> I just need to get in it you just need to take me to where I got to go and, you know that's it for real you know and I also guess. like putting your initials on the headrest doesn't add a lot to resale right no. unless the person has the same KD. initials <laughs> yeah. yeah but if you find someone who's Kathy a, Bates if the different name like yeah if you want to sell it to Kathy Bates she might pay a premium. For it, <laughs> but, but that's all I can think of. I think oh, these people it. get these cars, dump a ton of money into the stereo and yeah. the upholstery and all that shit, and it's not worth anymore when they're yeah. done. Yeah, you just gotta sit up and watch it get old. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can never sell it exactly because you put one hundred and ten grand into a car that stickered for sixty five and is now worth forty two. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk about money. Uh, someone just spent more than two hundred thousand dollars on an old pair of old Birkenstocks 
owned and worn by Steve Jobs. That set a record for the highest price ever paid for a pair of sandals at auction, according to the auction house. Uh, the tech pioneer's brown suede, just dirty Who old was ragged. second in the sandal department? Mm. You know, like Julius Caesar. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, who was yeah. another famous? Jesus. Who did he beat out? Yeah, exactly. someone from biblical days, right. be Job or Ham or yeah. somebody. Like, yeah. who's second in the sandal department? I mean, it's, it's not a- like somebody paid one hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars for Whoa. Paul Abdul's flip flops. <laughs> No, these went for two hundred eighteen thousand seven hundred fifty bucks. They thought it was going to go for sixty thousand. Uh, Mark Sheff, a former manager to Steve Jobs, so this is how, how do we even come to find these? He got his hands on these shoes during one of Jobs' many clearouts of his possessions. Real minimalist. In addition to the physical shoes, the buyer also, of course, gets an NFT because that's what we do now with a three sixty degree representation of the Birkenstocks. The shoes were reportedly on. Jobs feet in in the L.A. I'm sorry, the Los Altos garage where he and Steve Wozniak founded Apple and have been part of many museum exhibits. Um, We don't know who bought it, but, uh, you know, they got to have some good juju in them. He uh, I mean, those are well worn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. I always found Birkenstocks to be super ugly. Very. They're unattractive, right? Yeah. And then but they're German. And he liked all things German. Mm. That's why I loved Porsche mm. so much. So he he was a fan of German design. So it would make sense that he'd have the Birkenstocks and drive the Porsche around. Although those two things couldn't be further apart in class. Yes. Most expensive uh, footwear, Nike Air Yeezy 1 designed by Kanye, sold for one8 but we're in the most expensive sandal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not talking about like Michael sandal. Jordan's <laughs> shoe. I, I know. I, I, that's just another fact I found while, while yeah. looking. I can't find the second most. <laughs> I, don't think, I think the sandals. second most was just retail at the Foot yeah, Locker right, for exactly. a pair of Hirachis that were nice. <laughs> Whoa. Exactly. Yeah. Well, he's uh, now everyone who has like a Steve Job turtleneck sweater oh, or glasses of course. or everyone's excited now right yeah that's the look um so i know as you hear this thanksgiving is over no, i mean if you own any of that shit you're now sitting on a bunch of cash oh absolutely absolutely mm. uh as you hear this thanksgiving's over but i just found this fun fact and i have to share it with you because we've talked about sort of stuff around this had no idea this this is amazing so thanksgiving is very, very tied to TV dinners. And I really don't know if this is something that you knew already. Oh, I had, there was the turkey Thanksgiving dinner. Do either of you know why? No, I remember <laughs> that was a that was a winner yes, at the Corolla sure, house. It had sure. the turkey and it had a the little stuffing. cranberry cobbler yeah, thing yes. and a little thing. Yeah. And they even though we put a man it. on the moon, they could not prevent kernels of corn from getting into the cobbler. Right. <laughs> so you'd be picking out peas and corn yeah. from the hot cobbler that was in the middle. And I could always eat seventeen of those, yeah. but I just got the one. With the foil tray. Yes. Yeah. And then everything was kind of warm, but like the dessert was always piping lava hot. Lava hot. Okay. So yeah. we're on the same page. Rivaled only by the Jack in the Box apple pie that if you ever just bit into that thing, it would take your face off because it was molten <laughs> inside. The outer crust would cool off, but the inside was liquid molten death. Okay. Well, it, this is important news then. Bestlife.com reports that in 1953, due to an ordering error, Food company Swanson was stuck with 260 tons of frozen turkeys. And instead of tossing all the turkeys and taking a loss, Swanson salesman Jerry Thomas came up with the idea inspired by meals they served on planes. He ordered 5,000 aluminum trays and organized an assembly line of workers to fill them with turkey peas, cornbread, and sweet potatoes. That's how the TV dinner was born. Oh, the the TV dinner. The TV dinner, because the Swanson people overordered and said, wait a second, you know how on planes you get a little tray of food? And that's how we got the TV dinner. Mm. It's a good, it's a good tacit agreement and a balance between a super lazy mom and a hungry kid. (laughs) Sure. Which is basically 
I don't feel like making fried chicken. I don't know what Salisbury steak is. Mm-hmm. I'm not making a full trimmed turkey. No. But for buck ninety nine, I will pop this shit in the oven. Yeah. We yeah. love TV dinners. I was yeah, a, I do too. That oh, was a God. that was a big deal. What yeah. was the TV dinner of choice? Mine was the Salisbury steak. I love it. I, I still love it to this day. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't even lie. I'm just, I smash them for real. Were well, you a hungry man? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hungry man, yep. Hungry man. Mm-hmm. Sal's, all right, let's see if we can work this out. The Salisbury steak always felt weird to me. It felt like bologna. Like, I didn't know what it was comprised of. I stuck mm. with the fried chicken, mm-hmm. and I did the turkey, and then there was a Salisbury steak, and I don't know if there was a fourth one i just remember those things, i love the fried chicken because we you remember we grew up in a weight watcher snack wells house i never got to have good shit so when we got <laughs> fried chicken that was a big oh deal. they had a mexican food one they did yeah they had an enchilada with the beans and the and the rice oh they had an enchilada yeah they had an enchilada tray mm. too which uh, you know makes sense or maybe that was a socal thing i don't know but that was that has, well, lots of cans of corn. Yeah. Mm, yeah. My, my canned corn consumption is down 7,000% from when I was 11. You know what I mean? The, yeah. the vegetable would be a can of corn. Yes. Yeah. That was, especially when my dad was a bachelor. TV dinner. Oh, yeah. I got the Mexican style That's dinner. It. It's wow. got the enchilada. That looks like. Yeah, it's kind of a weird That's dark not a picture. Great picture. But it, <laughs> it had the enchilada. My grandfather used to customize it a little. He'd chop up a little tomato and sprinkle a little extra cheese on I top love of doctoring it. it, yeah. Yes, doctor yeah. that dinner. That's good. Definitely. Oh, they also had a Chinese one. Oh, yes. Are you yes. aware of it? Yes, yes. It's all coming back to me. I have, yes, I had the Mexican one. I had the Chinese one, mostly the chicken one. Yeah, the Chinese one was kind of, I, I, I don't ch- chow mein or something with something, bits of chicken and stuff. Yeah, very ba- basic. It was all a caloric mess. Yeah. It was not good With a you. giant pool of sticky sweet sauce in the yes. middle to dip. Yes, yes. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> Sounds good. And uh, <laughs> we didn't have a microwave. It was all, you know, 50 minutes in the oven. That is yeah. fancy as fuck if you can actually <laughs> oven bake that thing. Yeah, but it's it's an hour. That's true. Because it's a frozen brick when you get out of the freezer, and I'm just paced by that oven, just staring <laughs> into it, looking like, you know, you open the door, you let the heat out. That's I don't care. Another che- seven minutes. I'm checking on the enchilada, Ma. Get out of here. You two. What are you doing in the kitchen anyway, bitch? You don't cook. I'm looking after my own enchilada. Wow. The whole enchilada. I am in charge. And, Chris, they made also... One off, just enchilada in a tray. Ooh la la. Minus the rice, and it wasn't the whole dinner. Yeah. It was just a frozen enchilada. All the cart offering. Oh, somebody brought somebody brought up um, Taco Bell in the Enchirito. Mm. Familiar? The Enchir- I don't mm. Did they have that in Cleveland? <laughs> no. They have Taco Bell. Oh yeah. Well, now, but did yeah. they have it when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, that's that's only the tacos I used to eat until I came out here. I was like, everybody eat tacos out here. I'm like, that you know, they didn't we didn't do it in Cleveland like that, but t- Taco Bell was the spot <laughs> for real. Someone said they're bringing back yeah, the enchilada. So the they brought they're bringing back between now and November thirtieth. Oh, oh well, we gotta wrap like this a, shit up. Yeah, yeah. Marketing push. I'm so. getting over there. That's, that was <laughs> good. Wait, is that better than the Bell Beefer? Um, they're different. Uh, they're mm. equal. They're like my kids. I couldn't really pick one. Yeah. But the, <laughs> but the bell beaver. It was essentially an enchilada. Don't sleep on an enchilada. Most people go out Mexican food and they always get tacos yeah. or burritos. Yeah. Get an enchilada. Get yeah, a good. You won't be disappointed. Good enchilada. You will not be disappointed. Is this just a yeah. wet burrito? It's basically an enchilada, as far as I can tell. It's just a tortilla and beef and sauce okay. and, and so cheese. Good. Taco Bell enchilada. Yeah, that's okay. essentially essentially what it is. I don't know if they have cheese. Yeah, it's and- enchilada and burrito put together. Enchirito. Enchirito, it's, it's, right. It's, yeah, it's a flour tortilla with seasoned ground beef, uh, and then beans, diced onions, cheddar cheese, and red sauce. Wet burrito. Mm, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. looks good. Then. I want it. Yeah, it do. And the Bell Beefer <laughs> still, still after all the years of me complaining into a microphone. Have you heard of the Bell Beefer? That wasn't around no, for me. No. You're too young. 
No, I didn't have no. Uh. Was it like a sloppy Joe? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it it had all the components of a sloppy Joe, but it wasn't sloppy. Oh. It was just a hamburger bun, taco meat, shredded lettuce, and cheese. And I don't know, maybe a little sauce or that something. That looks pretty good, too. Yeah, that looked good. See? It, was yeah. a, it was a sloppy Joe without the slop. Yeah. Right, yeah. Solid. Yeah. Yeah, that looked good. I'll eat that, too. <laughs> Definitely. For sure. For sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right, gotta, well, let's bring it home, because I'm getting hungry. I know. We got to go get this back on track. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, Crazy Bone, the podcast, Truth Talks, and you can watch it on YouTube. And the foundation, if you want to get behind a good cause, spread the love. OH.com is where you go. And Martin DeGard taking Berlin, the bloody race to defeat the Third Reich, is. Uh, oh, am I missing something? Oh, I got a Jordan Harbinger first. Yes, yeah, all right. Uh, last but not least, there's Jordan Harbinger. All right. All right. Uh, Crazy Bone, uh, you can go to the website spreadthelove.oh. I should say spreadthelove.oh.com is where you go. Truth Talks, uh, available on YouTube. You can watch that uh, podcast. And then Martin Dugard taking Berlin. You can see me doing stand-up at the Rialto Theater December 15th in Tucson. And then we'll all be at the... Uh, Temp, I should say the uh, improv at Tempe. Yeah, 16th and 17th. Go down to uh, Good to see you. I was going to say again, but it was a different bone that came <laughs> yeah, into yeah, yeah. uh, Love yeah, Line. Brother, but yeah. thanks for uh, <laughs> hanging out with oh, us. Yes. Thanks for having me. So until next time, Adam Carolla for Martin DeGard, Crazy Bone, and Gina Grad saying mahalo. <laughs>